Go live, la 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 live, la live, go 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 live, la live, go 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 live. Go live, go live, go live, go live. Hello, everyone. <laughs> How are we all doing today? How's life going? So, <laughs> Aiden <Ain't> murdered. <laughs> Oh, gonna find a way of making those bigger, haven't I? And yeah, no, no, those bigger. It's easier if I go, if I remember to go live uh, different hands. Hello, everyone. How are you all doing? So, I'm gonna do something slightly different. In a second, I'm just gonna change this from the questions to properties. Go to the other option. There we go. If we show more and do all this and go down here. We've got turn to on size in the 1920s is on 10. We've got Imperial Russia does not collapse historically, so I saw on the Great War on 10. On 8, we have Blackburn Maximus Kangos at Jutland. And on 7, we have how would Imperial Star Destroyer look if it was designed by 1938 USN Royal Navy Marine and IJNRM and Soviet, uh, Regional Marina and Soviets, so that could be fun. Uh, I am, I should probably have this over on that side, then I'd be looking towards it instead of looking away from it, but, you know, that's, that is what happens. And, um, I have the chat all on that side, so that's the thing, I have other things on this side. I have all the chat screens on there. This is why I need, uh, this is why I'm starting to think I honestly need about four screens, but we'll leave that to one side, that's future Alex problem for when we, uh, when eventually we've worked out where when and where we're moving to and World War two tri uh, World War one tribals cool and I'm Canaris I'm still surprised because I always expect this one, I have to admit, to do better. Because there are so many random things you could do with four pristine 1910 class vessels. But yeah, it's pretty cool. And the moment this goes through, then at some point the um, March suggestions are going to go live. And they'll be live for a couple of weeks, so I can then take the. Uh, so you've got plenty of time to put suggestions in. That's the idea. But yes, and there are. Roughly 56 minutes left to vote. So if you haven't voted and you are interested in voting, Patron is open. That room, now what tier of Patron support can we get these without the singing? You don't like my singing? That hurts me. That wounds me. Um... Yeah, uh, in my way, the no singing I'm going to put up because, frankly, I've got some very expensive tax bills coming up. I'm going, I, 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 I'm going to say multiple hundreds of pounds. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what level of patron funding I'm at. That there you go. That's how much I am. Um, so yeah, they're basically double that, and maybe I'll stop consider stopping the singing occasionally. But I don't do the singing all the time. I don't always sing. I only sing when I feel it's particularly interesting to sing. <laughs> yes, that was singing. <laughs> That's cruel. <laughs> and I say, what's the, what's, the, what's the town class light cruiser started before the USN Brooklyn's and IJM Montgomery's were known? Pretty much. The design work and everything was started quite a while before they were known. And it was, it was it's done to the British need. Again, what do the British need? Uh, something which is honestly not a surface radar. It's a counter surface radar. So that's what the British are building a cruiser for. The others are built for different reasons, and they reflect that different reasoning. 
And last one, could the British build a 28,000 ton battlecruiser with a speed of 29 knots and an armament of 10, 40 inch? 45 caliber guns with 16, 6 and a half, 6 inch, 50s, and secondaries, and 5 and 12 inch main belt. Take that spec to Vickers in about 1912. I'm sure they go, we'll give it a try. It might not be exactly 28,000 tons, but it'll probably be close. Taking your cough is better. I'm hoping it's better. It's been feeling better. And in my coach, any user ship shaped rewards or the Trafalgar game? Well, the Trafalgar game was scheduled to happen, and then the pitch was literally flooded. And I mean, literally, the pitch was flooded. Um, so that's been kind of moved back. So we're going to see when we can re sorry, uh, rearrange that. And the um, ship shaped rewards, the um, coins, the challenge coins. Drac is in charge and organizing that one. And let, let's put it this way. Uh, Dan was trying and Dan found them very annoying, uh, difficult to deal with. So the engineer in our group took over. And the engineer in our group has, has been having fun. But thinks he's managed to solve the problem. And we'll get iron brew colored coins. What about turning your go live song into the intro for all your uh, videos like Drac's intro? I am considering starting some intro music, especially for the recorded videos. I just... I see all the trouble he's had with the recordings, with the, with the intros, and the recording music, and I'm just sort of case of... Um, I'm not sure if I'm at the point yet where the... And this is going to sound strange. It's not terms of financial cost. I'm not sure if I'm at the point... Where the need is justify uh, the need justifies the general amount of interaction I'm going to have to have with organisations over it. That makes sense. There again, I could record my own song. I have been considering getting the trombone out and recording my own music. Um, so I'm not quite sure what song I'd use. I might take suggestions for that. And try and record it on the trombone. Uh, Black Masters, how far was Adrian victorious from the Battle of Denmark Strake? She's with King George V, so. She did manage to launch a strike on Bismarck pretty soon afterwards, so they've got to be within strike range, so not further away than a couple of hundred miles, but trying to... It's a... Uh... Interesting time, an interesting discussion, that one. Um, honestly, it's, it's again, one of those interesting scenarios is going into, because I was talking about it with the whole HMS Unicorn scenario, and it's, it's those things, if she'd been available, I know Paul uh, from Chicago, who's a admin on this channel and is a really good contributor and supporter, has a firm view that she'd have ended up being used and sunk in pe during Operation Pedestal. I can understand his logic. I don't think so. I think she's probably used elsewhere. And something else is used in Pedestal. Because in a nice way, some of the reasons why Eagle and Furious are used in Pedestal is because they are the older carriers and they can, to an extent, be... The Royal Navy prefer not to lose them, but if they have to lose anything, they'll lose them. Whereas Unicorn is kind of useful. And can actually carry a larger air group and a lot more stores than Eagle. But leaving that to one side, I do think if she's available during 
during this operation, she's either paired up with Victorious and they have a pair of them together, because I can't see her being available and being available to be deployed elsewhere in the world is a completely different matter thing. I can't see her being far away from Home Fleet. She would be in a Home Fleet area. I could see her maybe... Her maybe hanging around with King George V and Victorious, which could go faster, having been assigned to Prince of Wales and Hood. And that would be a wholly, a very interesting scenario. That would be a very interesting scenario, because if you add a carry into the British force, A, on paper, they should have won anyway against Bismarck and Prince Jürgen. But, oh, that's on paper, and paper counts for the value of paper, frankly. It's pennies, if that. But if you have a carrier there, then considering the damage that one strike managed to achieve on Bismarck and then the strike from Ark Royal, etc. and all those things, if Victorious is within range and manages to hit repeatedly Hood as well as... Uh, uh, repeatedly hit Bismarck as well as guiding them in, then things change dramatically. Or if she hits Prince Yoga. It doesn't matter if you, which one they hit, but it causes the, it causes Luden, it, it causes them to have to have dilemmas to work out. But if, uh, Team Locker, should the Finnish Navy have had more had more hundred ton submarines before World War Two? Sure, it would have been nice to have had more, but there again, what are things you're going to pay for? How are you going to? Oh, do you have the infrastructure to build them? Do you have the infrastructure to sustain them? Do you have the crew to sustain them? It's a lot more complicated than just saying you should have more of these things. Yes, we'd like to have more because having more is always useful. But the Finnish Navy had also spent quite a lot of time fighting the Rus the Russians and concentrating on their tr their army, and there's a limit they can have on their naval power. I see. In question thirty-two, would I be right that the C's, D's, E, and the class of light cruisers <coughs> are inadequate against the Pensacola class and the County of York class? Are they the only thing other than the battle cruisers capable of killing them? Um, I think, if I remember correctly, with the Pensacola class. And for some reason, instead of bringing up my notes, brought up Pensacola. I love Microsoft o o Office. I really do. I want the cruiser. And I want my notes on the cruiser. I don't want you to tell me about... Why have they combined the search function? This is the whole point of having search. So I can type in and search my system. And find my notes without me having to search through the folders and go and get them. Because I need to remember the Pensacola class... They only have a 4-inch armoured belt. And whilst they have 10 8-inch guns, yeah. Basically, one-on-one, -on -one, I wouldn't want to be in a C, D, or E against them. But if I'm in a pack of Cs, Ds, and Es, then, frankly, I have a chance. Especially once you get to the factor that I have torpedoes. They have torpedoes as well. But this is the thing. With the, once you have torpedoes, torpedoes are great level. If you've watched any of my um, you Ultimate Adrenaline streams, the amount of times I'm getting confident my cruiser is ripping through the enemy on a convoy mission and I get slammed by something's torpedoes because I thought they were out of torpedoes and they actually weren't. And I I get sunk. It's the, it's the classic scenario and it really annoys me. But I, I do it so many times I, I get target fixated. I know I've got to work work on that one. But leaving that to one side, it happened on today's Twitch stream. Um, leaving that to one side, the reality is that as long as long as both sides have torpedoes, there's still a chance of winning a one-on-one -on -one fight. But if the moment you're dealing with multiple cruisers, and that's how the British like to fight, a multi-cruiser battle, you're, so you're saying C, Ds, Es. I cannot say the Cs, Ds, and Es are inadequate against the, the Pensacola class. They're inadequate solo. They don't. I wouldn't even say they're inadequate solo, really. I said they wouldn't have much of a chance solo. But in a group, it's like I was talking about with the helicopter video yesterday, and I was talking about the Type 45. 
And again, I talked about this today in the, UAD, in the Twitch stream, but I will talk about this again. Uh, someone commented that the Type 45 doesn't have anti-submarine warfare capabilities, and I'm wrong. Because it has nothing to queue and launch the cab, i.e. the helicopter. And I thought, well, I talked about this in the actual live. I said that the towed array on the frigate acts almost as like an airborne early warning system from the water. And you point, you say, you, with all the processing power you have on the frigate, all the computers, all the things, you then send the helicopters off to investigate. The Type 45 destroyer carries a helicopter. It carries a very, it carries usually a Lynx, which can do anti-submarine warfare work. Sometimes it can carry a pair of them, but usually it only carries one, but it's got quite a big hangar space, and they have been known to find ways to jimmy a second one in there. And the reality is that a helicopter is an anti-submarine warfare capability. That is a useful tool for anti-submarine warfare. And so when you're in a task group, and if you, let's say your task group is made up of three frigates, two, uh, two destroyers, and an aircraft carrier, and you go, well, you know, your anti-submarine your anti-submarine force is only three frigates, you're kind of talking twaddle, because it's not three frigates. It's three frigates, which might be carrying medium helicopters, so there's three medium helicopters as well. It's the two destroyers which are carrying the four light helicopters, let's say four links. So you've got four links on your anti submarine force. And you've got however many helicopters that are anti submarine warfare cable on your carrier, which let's say are another eight. That gives you 15 helicopters which are anti submarine warfare and going out hunting and can be directed by, the tar uh, directed by those frigates. So. Turning around and going that the Type 45 brings nothing to the anti-submarine warfare battle is wrong. The hull itself is not an anti-submarine warfare yasset. What that does provide, though, is it does facilitate with what it carries an anti-submarine warfare capability because of the helicopter it carries. This is what I mean when I say a task group is not just the sum of its parts. If you are talking about a task group as an air defence formation, well, if you're just looking at it going, well, there's the two Type 45s, that's their air defence capability, oh, and the F-35s off the carrier. Well, true, but there's also the frigates with their point defence missiles. And those are not a great anti-air anti anti -air warfare capability, I do admit, I'm not going to claim they are. But they are something extra to catch things coming in. Let's say one of those is a flak frigate. You know, this, this is the point I try and make continually. We cannot, you cannot analyze things and go by simple thing, the metrics of this must equal this. It doesn't. It's what does it bring to the whole task group? And you need those capabilities in the task group. You need the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the frigate. You need the destroyer. You need, possibly, your own submarine also down there hunting. Because, let's be honest, submarines are fairly good at taking out other submarines. It's a very useful thing. But that submarine's going to be out, probably acting in front of the task group. And let's, let's be honest, something might leak through. If something leaks through, what's going to engage it? It's going to be the helicopters, which are going to be guided in, queued in, by the frigate. And if the frigates... Let's put it this way. So the frigates are sending out their helicopters. Oh, frigate. Well, that's only that they, they might have three helicopters between those three frigates. So that's only three targets that can be an analyzed. And they've got no support to send them. Oh, well, that's a good job you have the destroyer's air helicopters. And those destroyer helicopters can be used all before you're interrupting airflow of aircraft on and off the deck of the carrier. That's four more helicopters you can call on. So that's a useful asset. That's a very useful asset, though, for, for anti-submarine warfare. My good shot. Alex, and Alex gets torpedoed again. Could become mean. It could if someone went through the videos and managed to get them out again. It doesn't. Is it a good idea to practice combat moves against other ships on your side, including ramming, before war is declared? Probably not, because let's be honest, do you really want to ram any uh, ships? I'm not sure if you can hear the wind outside. There's a lot of wind this evening. There's a 
a very small storm on the on the on the international scale compared to some of the storms going through the UK right now. But for the UK, it's quite a big storm, so expect to hear a lot of hyperbole on the um, television. See, Richards, modernized time. Do you move G turret to X to make room for some shiny stuff? Uh, that's going to require you moving around a lot of the insides. Remember, the turret doesn't just sit on top of the deck. There's all sorts of stuff beneath it. So, if you're going to do that, there is actually an argument where you get rid of that turret completely to make room for shiny stuff. You know, that there is that option. Turn into another version of Renown, in a way. And Renown and Pulse, in sort of, with only six guns. Let's mention, was the Japanese officer school as hard as the Japanese fighter school boss? Yes. It was. The Japanese officer school... You have to remember, Japan structured their recruitment. Instead of thinking, we're going to have only this many ships in 10 years' time, so we need to start structuring our recruitment to recruit the people so we can, we have that level of force available for those, those forces. No, the Japanese would wait till they had the ships, and then they'd start the recruitment for them. So they are always short of officers, which was made even more difficult by the fact they had a very difficult, very complicated uh, entrance system for officers, and on top of that, it was a very different course to pass. So it's a way of selecting some of the best of the best, it was hoped, but it was also a way of actually restricting their own forces. Dramatically. True confession, in the British global defence policy in the mid to late 20s, why didn't the UK upgrade the older coastal forts in the Empire, such as the late 100 ton, as the 100 ton forts to more modern armaments machinery? Mainly because the British government were cheap. And because they were putting them, the cost of all that was supposed to be borne by the local uh, colonial governments, and the colonial governments were even cheaper. Paul Hamus, where is the best place to get information to attempt to do the essay competition when one doesn't have access to book to book pertaining to the subject? Not to book, just for something to do. Uh, not for book, just for something to do. Um, you'll find if you look for information on the essay competition. If you go to the description underneath the video for the competition, you will find all the details there, and literally written out. And if there's more stuff you want, just message us on the uh, message us uh, one of the judges on Discord, and we've we've got all the stuff we're chatting about, and we're happy to sort of point you in direction of sources. We're not going to read through drafts because that gives people an unfair advantage. We are clear on that one. Um, you should find. In the details below, you should find, in the description below here, you should find a link to the essay writing competition. And it should be down in the description below. It should be the top line of the description below. I'm not quite sure if it works out like that, but it's what it's supposed to be. Hendrik Bofa, please rate this ship plausible and not useful as a, has a Dutch 1938 1047BC battle cruiser. Um, beam 20 meter, 65 foot, waterline 245 meter, 7 foot, uh, speed 36 37 at full load, free double 14 inch and in free dump turret layout. Um, that would sounds pretty good to me. That sounds pretty useful. It's certainly enough you're going to have to send something more powerful to go and fight it. It's going to wreck any cruisers you have that are in an area, and it's going to mean you're going to have to send battleships and things to actually engage it. So that's the that's the point of the, of the um, Dutch battle cruiser project. It's not to actually be a defense; it's to raise the bar. Which you want this, do you? How much do you want it? It's a risk fleet strategy, but done by a minor power, or rather a lower medium power at that point. 
and still a medium power to the state, really. I suppose if you compare them to the USA, and, uh, yeah, let's go. They probably would have been called a minor power, but we'd call them a medium power in today's today's climate. Um, Sam Thompson, have you seen the Navy Outlook video of the Royal Navy playing bumper boats in the airport the other day? Yeah, it happens. It happens. There's all sorts of weird comments going online, and the thing I point out is that most of the best admirals in World War II were people who crashed their destroyers. It happens. Black Man Maximus. No second Sino war, uh, war, a Japanese war. Japan joins the Allies on 20, June 25th, 1940. What is the impact? <laughs> um, American politics has a meltdown. Um, literally, American politics has a meltdown because how do they deal with that? Uh, if there's no second Sino Japanese war, then a lot of their reasons for cutting off funding and uh, try, uh, not cut, uh, you know, putting uh, embargoes on Japan disappear. So then they join the Allies. Uh, they they're in a complicated scenario. Because basically Japan's doing everything they theoretically want them to, but definitely not want them to, because uh, in this way they've got no re legitimate reason to have an argument with them, or to humble them, to establish American authority. And the thing is, please note, there's not so much plotting for war, but America wanted to be seen as the big power. They come out of their neutral phase and were heading towards wanting to be a big world power. And they saw, some of them saw Japan as a threat to this. They didn't want to war them over it. This is some of the things that often misunderstood. People go, oh, they were trying for war. No, they weren't. They were trying to establish their authority without war. And that was one of the stupid, that was the stupid problem. Because if they'd wanted a war, they'd have been investing in defense. So they could actually have the capabilities. For example, Pearl Harbor is a classic example of we're showing our status and capability by putting forward when we haven't prepared this base at all to, uh, at all for what it needs to be done. So it's a classic thing of politics show, don't, you know, make it a show, don't necessarily do. They wanted to show their power. They wanted the world to accept their power. They didn't want to have to fight for it. They didn't want to prove it. They didn't want to have to pay for it. And that's the problem, because in some regards, that actually sets the, the the tone for a war, because the Japanese basically call the American bluff. And yes, the Americans aren't bluffing. They can invest, they can really have those forces, they can really build that strength. They just didn't have it. They were acting like... It. It's kind of like today, there are some powers in this world today who try to act like they are already world number one. And will be world number one. Who uh, presume they will be number world world number one and act like it, or will will be whatever status they're going to be and and act like it. And the trouble is, that doesn't really work. Until you, there is a great line. There is an absolutely wonderful line in Game of Thrones, and it's a really old saying as well as being a great line in Game of Thrones. Anyone who has to say they are the king is no king. If you have to tell the world you are the most powerful, if you have to tell the world they should listen to you because you are strong, you aren't. Real power, real strength means you don't have to tell anyone, they know. The powerful person in the room is the one who can make everyone shut up with just raising an eyebrow, not the one who has to raise their voice and sh tell people to be quiet. Now, there is 
August 1919, the British um, coast of attacked the Russians at Kronstadt. Why and what happened? It's part of the uh, Russian Civil War after World, after World War One. The British were involved. At the end of the war, they were trying to assist, broadly speaking, the white Russian forces. And some people even got medals for it. But there will actually be a video about it at some point in the future, so I'm not going to get too much into that video. Black Maxwell, if War Spider and Victorious are turned into museum ships at the end of their careers, would it be a good idea to moor them together to show the surface fleet and fleet of air on one museum? It would certainly be nice to do so. Finding a decent museum for them would be interesting. A decent place to put them next to each other. It would have to be Portsmouth or Plymouth or maybe Liverpool, but, you know, it would have to be something like that. Um, probably Portsmouth, because that's really where we've put everything. And honestly... You would probably find myself and Drak in a fell never left. Honestly, Jamie Seadell, Armoured Carriers, would probably be permanently in the UK, looking at Victorious going, Ah, my pretty, my precious. My pretty, my precious. Like that the whole time. Um... Blackmouth, what if Japan kept the 40mm pom-pom instead of the type uh, going for the Type 96 25mm? If they'd gone with the 40mm pom-pom and built up a stockpile like they could have instead of going with 25mm, then the Americans could well have found the air, uh, the anti, uh, the air war a lot tougher. Because let's be honest, the 40mm pom-poms, they were reliable and they put up a large volume of fire. Yes, the Bofors gives you a longer range intercept but the volume of fire at a pom pom is massive and you can be slightly less on the quality of the ammunition as well so honestly for the japanese that could actually be a very good thing that would probably reduce some of their losses and increase some of the american losses Uh, sorry, nice to go front. So, with the 1913 Republic of China battlecruiser, is a large HMS Tiger design a good idea of what it would look like? Potentially. Nice I join the stream, and the first thing I hear is I get slammed. It happens, manly. It gets happen. It happens. Here it is. Where did the term tin can come from? I think as long as there have been iron and steel ships, there's been various slang around it, and tin can comes from that. Very good quote, Leslie Mitchell. Beware the quiet man, for while others speak, he watched, and while others act, he plans, and when they finally rest, he strikes. Dragon Red. Early helicopters. My only concern is the need for vibration in sensitive microtubes or transistors. As that was a problem with early helicopters. There are lots of interesting things about early helicopters, but I still think it works quite well. Especially for the kind of understanding. One of them was talking about some some of that scenario was sending me a whole message about how they'd have to deal with high speed sprinting boats and how the helicopters wouldn't have been capable of dealing with that. And I was looking at the things they were going, if the submarine's doing 20 knots underwater, then they, you know, that that's going to be problematic for them to deal with their manoeuvring, etc. What? The Type 7 does roughly 7 knots underwater. And that's going to drain its batteries quickly. Mostly moving on the surface, where it can do 17 knots. At which point I'm fairly certain the 90 knot helicopter can keep up with it. But that's the really interesting thing, because... You soon realize when you're talking about these other stuff on YouTube or anywhere that a lot of our perceptions of submarines come from the Cold War experience of submarines, which has dominated the narrative for a long time. And it's quite strange for people to realize that the submarines we're talking about in World War II are closer to the ones in World War One in that they're basically more submersible torpedo boats than they are submarines. And there's a difference there.
Jacob question. Are you aware of the joint Polish UK missile program, CAM medium range? Yes. Or as someone's calling it, CAM ER, but we'll leave that to one side. There's also Italians in doing a similar thing with CAM at the moment. Um, there's lots of discussions about improving CAM. Nice Aaron, the ED and C class cannot take on the Pentagon as their armor is too weak, and their older 152mm 45 caliber Mark 12 guns are not powerful enough to hurt the Pensacola. Okay, Knight 6831. Let me go back to the point I made. The point I made was individually no. However, as a group, if there's a pack of them, Three or four. That's how the British like to move. But let's consider the battle room of plate. Individually, should any of those cruisers be able to fight against the Grass Bay? No. What happened? They won. Why? Because they were able to outnumber and outmaneuver it. Now, the thing is, that means you have to factor that into when you're discussing it. So using absolute terms like this cannot fight this is therefore not correct. You are basically suggesting that because in a one-on-one -on -one fight the stats heavily favor the Pensacola class, and I do agree they do, that they should not fight them. Again, I point to torpedoes, but we'll leave that to one side. The reality is, though, the reality is that a real fight is going to be a pack versus pack. The Americans were far more likely to send out their cruisers solo than the British. Why? Well, you can argue it's World War One experience, but it's also a few other things in the nicest way in terms of American operations and how American operational doctrine goes. So the odds of meeting of a solo Pensacola bumping into a pack of British cruisers is not that low. There's also a possibility that you have a pair of American cruisers packing into a pack, bumping into a pack of British uh, British um, cruisers. And again, that's another interesting scenario as it works out. Because on paper, you are right. The 8-inch guns outrange the 6-inch guns. The 6-inch guns still have a higher rate of fire than the 8-inch guns by a dramatic effect. But leaving that to one side, they do outrange them. But let's be honest, the Pensacolas have four inches of belt armor, so that's not exactly that great. So if they do get into six-inch gun range, they're in trouble. They could be pepper-potted. And leaving that to one side, again, there's torpedoes, and there's the whole maneuvering and combat scenario. And how their forces act, to get, act with each other, and how they interchange. So, you are asking for an absolute statement. I would never give an absolute statement. Or rather, under those circumstances, I would not give an absolute statement. If you want an absolute statement, HMS Dreadnought versus HMS Victory. I'm going to say Dreadnought would win that one every single time. Even with Warrior versus the USS Monitor, when I discussed that, I would say the Warriors should win that battle pretty much every time, other than if the Monitor managed to get into shallow waters and managed to get the Warrior into shallow waters. But there again, the British would probably come up with a counter and think about that in terms of a task group. Because again, it's never an individual ship versus ship. Those battles were Age of Sail. In the Age of Sail era is when you deal with individual ship battles. It's very rare as time goes on. Yes, you still get some, but they get rarer and rarer and rarer because it becomes more and more about task group versus task group. Task Force versus Task Force. Fleet versus Fleet. On a wide, massive scale. But really, the only vessels that normally operate independent these days are submarines. In wartime. If you're an escort and you're moving independently, there is a reason for it. It's a very special reason. If you're talking about World War II... A scenario where you could be dealing with maybe a couple of cruisers on their own versus a couple of Pensacola, uh, Pensacolas would be a convoy escort. But then you've got to remember that occasionally for British for convoy escorts, there might have been an R-class battleship around. And then in a fight between a Pensacola class and an R-class battleship, I'm sorry, the 15-inch 42s are going to probably dictate that. Because the Pensacola is being a technically heavy, inch, heavy cruiser despite being built as a scout cruiser. But because it's got 8-inch guns, it's considered a heavy cruiser. Um, would be considered worth the 15-inch gun's attention. 
Demi did every element of the IJN have an approach to training that made their initial cadre the best in the world and their replacements next to useless? Uh, there was... Uh, it was certainly an obsession. It's not so much they're next to useless. This is this is the wrong thing to think about. It's that they don't intermix their veterans with their next generation well in their aviation units. With their C units, of course, you have the new the next generation of officers coming through. They're the junior officers on the ship, so they that, that doesn't happen so much. The aviation units have very few veterans, whereas... Again, the British and American system of bringing back experienced pilots to act as test pilots, to act as instructors, to act as all sorts of things, and then rolling them forward to go with the new squadrons and splitting squadrons up, etc., to form the base of new squadrons, so that you know you never had all your experience concentrating one squadron, but never had all your new people concentrating one squadron either. So squadrons were on were individually less capable, but the whole wider force was as aggregate far more capable. Um, that's complicated to arrange and organize, and honestly, the Japanese might have gone with that approach in the end, but the trouble is they lose so many in midway in a few other battles that it just makes it impossible. Stafford Thompson. Surprising amount of damage from uh, such low speed collision, to be honest. A lot of our. T I don't know if. I don't think they were. I think they're sand down, so I'm not sure if they are fiberglass. They're not, I think. They are aluminium hull. But um, minesweepers are made to be as light as possible in, in terms of magnetic material, which can affect it. Thank you, uh, Jack Ray, for the um, super chats. Uh, not the super chats, the memberships, by the way. Not sure if I said it earlier when you did it. Thank you for those. It's always very kind when you do that. I know it makes YouTube very happy with me. They send me a beep every time I get a certain number of memberships a month. They're, they're always very happy. They monitor these things. They monitor so many things. They tell me off because I don't do... I'm going to do it now so I just stop getting it flashing up. I'm going to see. If I do it now and it stops flashing up me for the rest of the video, for the live, we'll see if it worked. Okay? So... If you like the video, please like the video. If you like that, if you like and to see more videos like it, please subscribe. Both the buttons are down below. And if you like to, there's also membership of the channel down below as well. It's a great thing which allows you more emojis. If you'd like to support the channel even more, there's Patreon and there's Kofi, which are both up here, I think, that you can go for. Kofi includes sending me personal messages, which apparently has deleted, has now digressed into my family using it to send me personal messages. When my aunt and my cousins want to wind me up, and various other cousins do, and various other aunts do. So I am now occasionally getting messages from them going, Would you like a cake brought in Saturday? And here's some money for Iron Brew. Thank you. Thank you, relative, very much. And this is confusing me. So, there you go. Let's see if YouTube realizes that and stops bugging me. We can hope. If the US needed to, how quickly could they build 12 strike class cruisers starting in 1980? Um, a number of yards. Probably could have three in production at any one time at those two yards. So probably could have. S They're going to take roughly three years. So your first pair are going to be delivered in 1983. You want to have 12. So. Uh, you could theoretically have them all in all enter service by nineteen eight in nineteen eighty eight, with nineteen eighty three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, a pair being delivered each year. If you really push it, practically it's probably going to be nineteen eighty nine and to nineteen ninety. Henry Beaufort, how much does the Battle of Java, uh, Java go if three of the proposed ships are present? Well, A, the Battle of Java changes because you have a far more senior Dutch commander who's going to actually have a decent staff in place. Because, let's be honest, the battle crews are not going to be commanded by anyone less than a rear admiral, probably a vice admiral knowing the Dutch, because they, they are going to be special units, and they're going to have a senior officer with a staff present, which is going to change the coordination of the whole force. Uh, how different does it go? Well, considering how good the various radar-guided weapon systems 
that the Dutch built, like the Hayes Marriks, etc. were. I'm guessing they'd have fire control radar of some kind fitted as well, and various other things. So probably goes pretty well for the Dutch, because let's be honest, there's nothing really in the Java Sea Force which could take them. I'd actually say more than likely the Java, the Battle of Java is delayed until either the Congos or something else is ready to be sent with them to come and support the force coming down there. They're not going to try just heavy cruisers and light forces. By the uh, the A4W nuclear reactor used in Nimitz class, could they be used as small nuclear plants for cities? Yeah. To be honest, they do that in disaster relief anyway. They tend to, if they can, if they can, they hook the um, carrier up to the shore with a power line and start take and take over powering of the entire of, of the place which has been affected. If they can and if it will be helpful, so yes, they could. But it would it would require infrastructure to be built. And I can read equitable naval treaty. Japan never went to war with China, but showed up with a copy of its World War One commitment, asking. Um, the Royal Navy where they want them because Nazis. Uh, the Royal Navy goes, woohoo, hello, and where would you like to go? Let's go, and have them, and let, let's be honest, let's start off with taking out the Italians. That's going to be the first thing. They're going to take out the Italian Navy. That, uh, let's put this lightly. Let's consider the carriers available in 1940 for the Japanese and the carriers available for the Royal Navy in 1940, add them together, send them off to do Taranto option. So basically, the uh, Italians get hit at night by the British, and then in dawn, when they think everything's safe, the Japanese come in. I don't think there's much of a Japanese, uh, an Italian Navy left after that point, at which point, if the Mediterranean's been pretty much secured, and Crete's not fallen, etc., the North African campaign will probably be over fairly quickly. Japanese might get introduced to armoured warfare if they come and take part in that one. Then you've got to deal with Germany, and Germany's got to deal with the fact that the British can basically focus on them. Langus, what did the U.S. have in their arsenal in 1980 that could, uh, could sink battleships? Um, a huge number of nuclear-armed weapons. Quite a, fair large, a fairly large number of bombs. Um, torpedoes. There's a reason why the British have World War II-era heavy torpedoes still in service in the Falklands War. Naval Guide, how effective was the Canadian Sea Power Aspire system that was present on the second Iroquois class destroyers? Um, it was about a as effective as the American system. It had slight half a dozen one sixty other in some capabilities, but yeah, it was it's about the same. Uh, Jack Ray, did the destroyers of World War Two um, use splinter protection arm much? If so, was it commonly over their entire superstructure? Yes and no. Some of them certainly did cover it, but often quite a lot of the sprint protection was sandbags. <laughs> you, if you go to some of the destroyers in wartime, you would have found some sandbags, some hessian matting, uh, hessian cloth, that sort of stuff put over it. You'd find various things done to try and adapt it and make it work. Um, there was a lot done to try and reduce splinters, but it was also wanted to be light. Uh, so, yeah, not so much, but it worked. My masters, with 15,000 ton limit for cruisers in Washington Naval Tree, but still with an 8 inch gun limit, what kind of ships would everyone build? Um, I'm guessing the Royal Navy would probably end up with County Class, which had four triple turrets on them. Because let's be honest, building a triple 8 inch turret is not that difficult. Um, so you'd end up with 12 8 inch guns on the County. And. Oh, goodness knows what the Americans do. Let's be honest, the Pensacola class. The Pensacola class would definitely have 12. Would definitely have 12. Uh, the question is going to be how fast they build them to, whether they still build them to be the same 32 and a half knots. Probably.
Probably, but they, they get more interesting. They get more interesting as time goes on. Um, as for the Japanese, well, just expect them to try and manage to get an 18 gun cruiser on there. Tashiro Vichel, what got you into Amber in the first place? Isn't it the most common drink in the England? I am I know I have this wonderful accent, but that's because my mum and dad's family met in the middle. My dad's family and my mum's family both have Scottish heritage, and my mum's family has Cornish heritage. So my mum's family are Scottish, Cornish, uh, Scottish, then Cornish, then um, has slowly moved up the country, but still have quite a large connection with the Scots, Scottish part of their family. And my dad's family was Scottish and then Liverpool and came down. And so I spent a lot of... Basically, when growing up, I, we, were either on, we were either down in Cornwall when we went into school or up in Scotland. And so I got into Iron Brew. And believe it or not, it's quite common in Cornwall and in Scotland. There is, it, it's far more common. In most of the fish and chip shops I go into in Cornwall, I can usually get Iron Brew with fish and chips. Or as I normally have, I have to admit, I normally just have the battered fish. I I'm naughty. I I don't have the chips that often. I'm I I, I don't mind eating chips. It's just I tend to avoid it as a rule because you can get chipped out quite easily. <sighs> HMS Unicorn wasn't that expensive. Um, whilst I do agree she's a class of one, she's also built in a period when the Royal Navy's building a lot more ships. There's a lot more yards competing for orders, so she's not as expensive as a class of one would be today. And also, the other advantage the Royal Navy had in that period was they had their own yards, remember? And the direct naval constructors. And so they knew roughly how much things would cost to do. So if you tried to charge an excessive amount of profit from it you get into trouble very quickly. Unicorns built by Harlan and Wolf for the price of £2,531,000. I'd say that's quite valid, quite useful. I said, would a pack of iron colors protection have a county of York nearby? They could well have a county of York in them. Um, I was asking, as I'm trying to explain why the Pensacola would prompt an R8 224mm cruiser response. Basically, the Pensacola class don't have any impact on the British, or anyone really. They all look at them and go, ah, reconnaissance cruisers, because. Pensacola class, even the Americans felt they were sort of a little bit light. You have the Salt Lake, you have... Uh, honestly, it, it gets sort of... How do I put this by? The Northampton class are an improvement. But they drop down from 10 guns to 9 guns in free triple turrets. And their belt armor is even worse, but their internal subdivision is slightly better. However, there is a reason why, when you sort of look at the Pensacolas, you go, right then, what's their fate? They survived World War One, uh, World War Two. Great. Northamptons, which were some of the improved ones. Sunk at the Battle of Tassafaronga. Survived, survived, for Chester and Louisville. And then sunk at the Battle of Rennell Island, sunk at the Battle of Sundra Strait, and then survived for Augusta. And you go, okay, what's happened here? Well, the trouble is the Americans were building scout cruisers. And they were really good scout cruisers, but that means they're not really what you want to send in to fight. They're able to go very fast. They're armed with enough firepower they can drive off most threats which can catch them. Yeah, they're in trouble. An RN, pa um, I would add that an RN, a bunch of RN prote uh, commerce protection cruisers could well have a county class cruiser or something as their lead ship. 
So that's the other fun for a Pensacola class in any fight. It could find itself versus a pack of Cs, which is going to go, I can win this fight easily! And there's a county in there as well, so it's got a choice. It can either ignore the Cs and concentrate on the county, or it can ignore the county and concentrate on the Cs. Either way, it's in trouble. Because if the Cs get close enough, that their 6-inch guns can work, they will work. And if their torpedoes can work, then they're, you're in real trouble. Senator, when HMS Dreadnought was in the 20 to 25,000 ton standard, how would a World War II cruiser in tonnage, what would that tonnage look like? So, if you're sort of going, if you think about it, once you're talking about 35,000 tons, down to 25,000 tons, you're talking about something which is five sevenths. So if you take 10,000 tons and you go down five, uh, to five-sevenths of that, you are dealing with roughly, and I do say this roughly, 7,200 tons. Captain Cam Seafort, uh, effectively a mirror of BBM's questions, I'd like the Maxwell's questions, what would the cruisers of the major navies look like if the Washington Naval Treaty set limits as... At 8,000 tons and 6 inch. Assume that Hawkins are being built. Um, basically, they'd be starting to work on... Well, hang on. If the Hawkins haven't been built, then it's... Um, okay, sorry. If you're talking about that, so you're basically using the E-Class as your, um, your standard. Uh, pretty much... E class, Leander class would be sort of your model of your cruisers, because the Leander class are less than that, and so yeah, it'd be the e, e class, the Leander class, they'd be what your cruiser would look like. Captain Z four. Bangladeshers. How were the oxygen-enriched torpedoes of the Nelson class stored? Were were they filled before launching or already pre-filled? Honestly, can't remember. Honestly, cannot remember. I'd have to look that up. Please send me a Discord message or something to remind me of that one, and I'll look it up and I'll answer it next week. What are the books from like continuing last week or new? Uh, they're a mixture. There's a couple continuing from last week. There is a couple continuing from last week. And there are a couple which are new. That one, that one, that one, and that one. But I'm answering questions first, because my view is always to try and answer some questions first. Henry Bofa, in the 1910s, how much cheaper could the per unit cost of capital ships be if countries had ordered a larger class, like 8 or 10 in a time instead of a mixed bag, or especially Germany? Well, the trouble is, you're... How do I put this? You can get things cheaper if you can order the quantity. So, the two things which are driving are drive your cost up. If you order, consistently order less than your system can provide, or you consistently order more than your system can provide. Okay? So, you can order slightly more than the system can provide, and it can grow to accommodate it while still maintaining the cost advantage. You can't overload the system, though. So if you, for, the, for the Germans, if they'd ordered 8 or 10 at a time, their yards couldn't build that many. They couldn't, uh, couldn't build that many at a time. So they'd be staggered, they'd be ordering them, but they would take years to get in. And by the time they got into service, they might well be out of date compared to the latest British ones, because the British could order 8 to 10 at a time. And that's the other problem. If the Germans ordered 8, the British would mirror that by ordering 8. And the British can afford to. The British have yards that they can do. The thing is, the British are ordering, even in the run-up to World War One, less, slightly less than their capacity can supply, which is the most efficient. 
as long as there are other system, other things maintaining that supply, that capacity, i.e., there's other orders, there's merchant ship construction, there's all sorts of other construction, maintaining that capacity, you can continue to do that, and you can get the most efficient construction. But that is a weak spot because that can leave you in a bad position to grow your economy. And then you, the British maxed out during World War One. Um, anyway, I meant, what if, what would a World War Two cruiser in twenty to twenty-five thousand ton range look like? Eight inch or nine point two inch? Because twelve inch would be over the Alaska. It would be nine point two inch or twelve inch. Be one of those or uh, those regions. And the twelve uh, cru Alaska was a cruiser. It's a large cruiser, but it's actually where heavy cruisers. If you think about it from this perspective, okay. If in your world your battleships are 45,000 ton plus, your capital ships are 45,000 ton plus, which is where they were heading, 60,000 tons, then your cruiser shouldn't still be 10,000 tons, your, especially not your large heavy cruiser. Your heavy cruiser should probably be 20 to 25,000 tons. That's proportional. Ethan Yang, what are your thoughts on the Italian Andrador and Vittorio Veneto helicopter cruisers? Will you be making a video on those ships anytime soon? I think they're going to come in. They are scheduled in my mind for uh, Key Ship Series 10, I think. Nice to go, everyone. If battle cruisers invincible into Fatic Ball Queen Mary hadn't blown up, given the damage they took, how long would they have been out of action for? Probably six months to a year. Question is, could the British have repaired them? Yes. Would they? Um, that's an interesting question. If they have Renown and Pulse coming online, there's going to be a strong temptation maybe not to. They might do it just to keep maintain numbers. They might do it to maintain numbers and maintain uh, to uh, grow the fleet even more. But there's also going to be a temptation to go slow and bring Renown and Pulse online. So, today's first book. Let's go with this. Battles of the Pacific War, the official Admiralty accounts. These are of the battles of Midway, Coral Sea, Java Sea, Guadalcanal, and Leyte Gulf. They have it has pictures in, but it's also the official Admiralty documents. So yeah, you can find some pictures from the documents as well in here. Pictures that the Royal Navy managed to get hold of. Sinking of the USS Langley seems appropriate to discuss, considering what we were discussing the other day. These actions did little to arrest the Japanese advance and to meet the serious deficiency in aircraft of the Allied fleet. On 22nd of February, the American seaplane tender, Langley, Commander Robert P. McConnell, U.S. Navy, in charge, with 32 assembled P-40Es on deck and with the pilots and flight personnel on board, and the Sea Witch with 27 crated P-40Es in her hold, were detached from a Fremantle Ceylon convoy and diverted to Java. 
Langley left the convoy several hours before the Sea Witch. On the morning of 27 February, the Langley met two US destroyers, the Whipple and the Edsel, and proceeded with them towards Tijiltam. Tilatja, South Java. At 0900 hours on 27th, when within 100 miles of that port, they were sighted by an enemy plane. The Langley, having only a small flight deck, was unable to launch the fighter she carried, and no help could be given her, as there were not 15 fighter planes in the whole of Java. At 11.40 hours, when within 74 miles of Tilatja, nine enemy bombers arrived and attacked. On their third and last bombing run, run, the Langley received five direct hits and three in the rear misses. She was heavily damaged, and although the fires were got under control, at 1352 the order was given to abandon ship, and the Whipple sank her with nine four-inch shells and two torpedoes. Casualties were six killed and five missing. A Sea Witch arrived at Tiltjab on the forenoon of the 28th. There was no time, however, to assemble the crater planes in view of the immense landing of the enemy uh, on Java, and they were apparently destroyed in their crates when Tiltjab was abandoned. Sending crated aircraft to Java. Honestly, I can understand why they did it. I just don't think it's necessarily a good idea. It's a reaction. We've got to send aircraft to Java to help Java's defense. Yes. But you do that. You are putting yourself and your forces into trouble. Now, the thing I like about these books, this book, is it literally comes from the archives. It literally is taking the archive documents out and going through them and printing them out and copying them out. So what you're reading is as close to a National Archive document or documents in National Archives as you physically can get. It's as close to them as you can get without having to visit National Archives. Compiled by John Greenan. It's kind of interesting. Um, you have... All sorts of interesting discussions in here. I... Really cannot recommend it highly, more highly or... More, I say it's more interesting because... Again, last week we were talking about understanding the Japanese Navy. This is a good way to understand the flood of the Pacific War from the idea of the people involved in it. Being taken by as much of a neutral party as you can imagine the Royal Navy was at this point. This comes from Naval Staff History's Battle Summaries 23, 28, 40, 45 and 46. One of the things you have to remember is it's not been possible to reproduce all diagrams from those reports, but they are really interesting things to go through. So there you go, first book today. Great Naval Battles of the Pacific War. So let's uh, go through and put in... some tag points Let's go back to the questions. Uh, nice turn. If the battle cruisers invincible, indefatigable, Queen Mary, I'll answer that one. Uh, nice turn. So, would 9.2 inch armed cruisers have been the ideal choice to replace the invincible, indefatigable class battle cruisers? Um, potentially. In certainly in so, in their initial role, yes as improvements aboard, because they are Dreadnought Armoured Cruisers, so to replace them, you're looking at 9.2-inch gun heavy cruisers. To replace battle cruisers, their role as battle cruisers, you'd be building more Admiral class, probably. Now, Black Mamaxos, given the uh, Nano Remo, 
or National Novel Writing Month is a challenge to write 50,000 words in a month. Seems good to have limited your chance to 10,000. Okay, has anyone submitted anything yet? I haven't checked yet. I can go check that now. I don't think anyone will have actually uh, actually done that yet. But we always check. I do. I, I have. I logged in. I've logged in most days, but I haven't logged in today. So far, nothing has been received. The only email I've received so far has been the test email that went between back and towards between me and Gareth. To check the system was working. So yeah. But you know, that's all fun. That is all fun. Welling out there. Right. Anyway. Why has that done that? Oh, good lord. Computer, you are annoying me. It's logged out for some reason. <sighs> Sorry if the um, things have disappeared. I will attempt to remedy it immediately. Oh, frigate. Computers are fun. Yes, ma'am. Well, at least the live chat's still working. I know the live chat's working because that's hooked up through OBS and is running. Hello, yeah. That, thank you for that running now. Let's go to the Q&A. Yay, questions is working. Ah. <sighs> oh. Right then, Patreon. Make sure that's live so I can see when that happens. Yay, that's working. And... There are... Poll has ended now for Patreon. And the winning positions on 10 each are Senator Tillman survives in the 1920s. What does the Washington Naval Treaty look like? And Imperial Russia does not collapse as it historically does and survives a great war. Cool. Okay, I'll put those up in February. Um, Lamas, what is the strategy for the fleet air arm for helping the battleships in the line of battle model 2? They're not really going to be... Ha they're going to be spotting for them, but they're not really ha providing air defense for them, but honestly, they're going to be also striking enemy ships. But in a nice way, the Royal Navy isn't thinking of a battle line in World War 2. That's World War 1 era idea. The Royal Navy's thinking of actions like Cape Matapan, like, to an extent, what happens... In the Battle of Denmark Straits and the Battle of, of the Battle of Eventually Sinks, the um, the sinking of the Bismarck. You know, those are the sort of battles the Royal Navy is thinking about, and they're thinking about aircraft being involved in those operations. They're thinking about pedestal. 
Now, those kind of convoy operations. So, yeah, the, the, there is there is stuff there if there is a line of battle, but line of battle is really low down the, the Ronnie's priority of preparing for, for World War II. It's really not considered a likely occurrence. And if the British or Germany built ships with triple turrets, would it be worthwhile replacing the turrets with larger caliber dual turrets, or depends on how much funding they have, whether they can do that. For the British, it might well be an advantage to do it. But for the Germans, it's going to be a problem for them to do it. The British might well do it, because it upgrades their their, capable, their firing capability. So let's say if they built all their ships with triple 12-inch guns, and then they'd upgrade them to 13.5-inch guns, they could upgrade the 12-inch ships to twin 13.5-inch without any trouble. They could upgrade the triple 13.5-inch to twin 15-inch without too much issue. <laughs> Me issue. And considering they had the 16 and a half inch gun coming, it could have been an interesting uh, and coming online for the G3s. It could have been interesting. They could have might have tested it by upgrading some of the I don't know Queen Elizabeth class, maybe, maybe even Renown and uh, Renown and Repulse, or even Hood herself from triple 15 inch to twin 16 and a half inch. In which case, you could end up with a Washington Treaty where, instead of it being 16-inch limit, uh, limit of gunnery, it'd be 16.5-inch guns. Imagine that, writing that into a Washington, Na uh, Washington Naval Treaty. It's not going to be 400, uh, 400 mm different uh, as your sort of gunnery factor. It's going to be 420 mm Yeah. How does that change things? Does it or doesn't it? it? You know, it's going to be. It would be a factor. It would certainly change something. Does it change it a dramatically lot? Well, the Americans might then be developing a new sixteen and a half inch gun for their later ships because they're building them with sixteen inch guns. But the next ones, the South Carolinas, etc., onwards, you'd expect to have sixteen and a half inch. Under that scenario. They might stick a 16-inch. The British, after having provided a 16.5-inch upper gun limit and capability, don't then get maybe Nelson and Rodney? Because they already have the 16.5-inch gun ships, so they can't really make the claim for 16 inch which means they might be actually building ships later on. You think about it, if they don't have Nelson and Rodney, then their likelihood of them not building ships under, in 19, uh, uh, under the 1930 London Naval Treaty is very low. Because they don't have, new, they didn't get the new ships in the 1920s, which means they start their construction about the same time as the South Carolinas, probably. We consider the South Carolina class. Is it South Carolinas, or am I, am I getting, I'm going the wrong battleships again? I'm getting my Carolinas mixed up, aren't I? Oh, America, America, America. North Carolina class, yes, it's in the North Carolinas. Why, why do this to me, America? Why can't you, why can't your states have different names? Why are they North and South Carolina? Why are they North and South Dakota? Why do you do this to me, okay? It's cruel and unusual punishment. I'm dyslexic. This is not fair. It's not fair. Surely you should adjust your entire naming strategy for me, and my specific learning needs. Surely, America, you should. <coughs> anyway, North Carolinas, uh, they're built 37 to 41, so they're ordered slightly earlier. I think the British would probably have ordered their, uh, would have ordered the King George V slightly earlier, uh, ordered something equivalent to them, and it would be a different scenario. Again, that changes things. If you have Britain ordering battleships earlier with a different first sea lord and a different mix, you might end up with different guns being chosen. Tim Rich, did aircraft on Unicorn on Unicorn ever use a rolling takeoff?
I have to remember, rolling takeoff used to be the standard takeoff measure before they had uh, before they put in the um, hydraulic catapults uh, or rather pneumatic ca uh, catapults. I would say yes, because I'm fairly sore swordfish operated from it, and they tended to like to do rolling takeoffs when they were going off on reconnaissance hunts. Um. My turn. Did question twenty-eight? If the invincible defatables weren't adjourned, what would have gotten in their place? Whatever's available. The thing is, if they're they, if they're not there, then they're off doing something else, and something else is there instead. So let's say they were sent to assist instead of Queen Elizabeth. So then Queen Elizabeth is there as rounding up numbers. Basically, the Royal Navy has a finite number of resources in terms of its numbers of ca battle cruise ships and battle cruisers. And if you deploy one there, you know, you don't have that there. So if they don't have them there, then you don't have them there because they're somewhere else. Doing something else. In which case, whatever's there might well be back here in the Royal Navy. But there again, there's also the scenario that that might well happen if, I don't know, Renown and Pulse have been completed earlier. And the, the R-Class and the Queen Elizabeth were all in service. Because then you might have changed around your force structures. So, Thompson, how would the Treaty Era differ if light cruisers were rated to 12,500 tons, 6-inch guns, and at 16, heavy cruisers were rated to 15,000 tons and up to 12-inch guns? Would their traditional maximum total limits fare? Um, no. Honestly, you wouldn't have their traditional maximum total limits, because no, those limits are worked out in relation to numbers of ships per for that tonnage. So, things would be different. I would also say they'd be, those ships would be far bigger, far more powerful, but they have the same issues. Yeah, you have an extra two and a half thousand tons for a light cruiser. That's great. What do you do with it? They all 15, 15 gun ship light cruisers, and for your heavy cruisers with twelve inch guns, that's wonderful having fifteen thousand tons and twelve inch guns. But that's not going to be a lot once you start looking at the weight of twelve inch guns and the systems to operate them. So you're going to be facing a real, real issue of what do you do? Do you go for faster, more numerous guns, or firing more numerous guns? Or do you go for those 12-inch guns to have the heavy hit at long range? Is a cruiser going to be able to give you the heavy hit at long range with that with the with 15,000 tons of stability? Alternates, ideally, what ratio do you use between primary and secondary sources in your work? If in doubt, I prefer to work with primary sources than secondary. I prefer to work with something which is the unfiltered bias of the original writer, the original source, rather than a bias which has been filtered through the bias of someone else because we all have bias. The thing is, once you accept that, it's fine and you work with it. So when people start writing off sources because of bias and I go, well no, actually, the bias, when you acknowledge it, you realize it, you look at it, you work it out, you can, it's actually useful because it tells you not just about the source but about the author, not just about the facts but the, but the, the context. Galactica, any good books on World War II minesweepers? You asked me that question, I was reading one earlier, and now I cannot see it for the life of me. I was literally hiding out here from family visits earlier, reading books, and that was one of the books I was reading. That's a really annoying... Where the frigate have I put it? To Amazon purchase list, because I'm presuming it came from Amazon. I will find its colour and it's got in a thing. Except... Mm-hmm. 
Uh, yes. Right, so you're going to look, want to look for Commander Richard J. Go uh, J. R. Goodwins. A view from a Minesweeper's uh, Bridge, Royal Navy Officer's World War II Memoirs. It's £3.50 Kindle version, twelve ninety nine hardcover version, and nine ninety nine paperback. I have the paperback, and that's been more than fun for me to read, and it's quite a cool book. And that says, it's Commander Richard J.G. Gordon. Goodwin. Goodwin. Commander J Richard J.G. Goodwin. Um, I'll ask, also add, if anyone's putting questions in the live chat, please put them in the Q&A. It makes it far easier for me, for me to separate them off from the chat. Yeah, don't get me started on that, Sonic and Era. America building South Carolina, then North Dakota, then South Dakota, then North Carolina. It just, it, it's just designed to confuse me. Hey, Dawson, is VA and WV better? Not really, Virginia versus West Virginia, but there is a fact I can remember West Virginia comes from the American Civil War because one part of the state decided it really didn't want to be, uh, didn't want to secede. And the other part was the cornerstone of the succession, secession because without Virginia, they didn't have an industry or infrastructure or anything, which is why they stuck up, uh, they stuck their capital there, and which is why you end up with that very, very strange scenario of basically the entire American Civil War coming down to the distance between uh, the capital of Virginia and Washington. And that's why you end up with all the battles of the Bull Run, etc. Because, frankly, that's one of the few spaces on that road you can have a battle! Um, no, sir, is it, is it because of Battlecruiser Invincible blowing up the catastrophic with loss of nearly all the crew why her name took so long for her name to be reused? To an extent that, but also to an extent the fact that the Royal Navy did consider the name a bit of a hubristic one. It's a bit of a hubristic one. Um, uh, not all. I think from the chat that it might be good uh, a good idea to box a compass. It's usually sensible to box a compass. Um to actually find my books, the books that I'm hunting, that, that I don't think compasses work on them. I will say this, though. There are a tremendous amount of audiobooks for sale at the moment on Amazon, and I'm apparently getting suggested all of them. And that's what I, I, I find that strange, because I don't actually use audiobooks. Probably one reason why I never get any audible funding, because they know I don't. Uh, they know from my own system I do not bother with. Aud I do not have audiobooks. And mainly I don't do audiobooks because, frankly, I end up arguing with them, and that just looks weird. That'd help build Galactica. Um, okay. So, later on, has Matrix Invincible the light cruise and light carrier inverse and the Dean name after our predecessor's catastrophic demise? Do you really need to redeem the name? The name's not at fault. The use of the ship was at fault. They're using. A cruiser in a capital ship role, and it got bushwhacked. 
it happens. I might have done that today on on the on the get on the um, Ultimate Adrenals, but there again, I think if I remember correctly, I was in a battle and I had two destro two light heavy cruisers, three light cruisers, and a hunting pack of destroyers, and we took on one battleship and took it out. That happens. Stafford, I was making. Thank you for answering both my questions. I was raking the snow off the cowport roof when, with the foot with the first answer, and I would have imagined they used the extra tea on armor and stores, tons of armor stores for the lights potentially. Um, for the heavies, the t uh, the tier range would allow for a great field of design mm, potentially, potentially. I think. You might be actually reversing that round because you put eight-inch gun uh, destroy uh, eight-inch gun cruisers for convoy protection, and twelve-inch snipers for the scouting the battle line. Well, if you consider the purpose of scouting the battle line, you're going to want speed. You don't want to fight. You want speed. So you're more likely to go with eight-inch guns for that role, and uh, maybe nine-point-two-inch guns. I would argue probably nine-point-two-inch guns, but to deal with any cruiser you come up against, but 8-inch guns would be more likely lighter guns to be used for the scouting role. The heavier vessels would be the convoy protectors, and the reason you'd have that is you'd want to have a vessel which could deter larger assets. So yeah, I can win a fight with a 16-inch battleship or battle cruiser, armed battle cruiser, versus a 12-inch cruiser. I can win that fight, but I'm probably going to get damaged in that fight. Because I'm unlikely to wipe them out in the first salvo. If I get damaged, where do I go for repair? And that's my problem. Have I drunk any iron brew in this video so far? Can you please remind me? Because if I haven't, I need to I need to drink some. Um Now you mentioned, did the British four inch air guns on cruisers use proximity fuses later on in World War uh, in World War Two? They had all sorts of upgrades later on in World War II, so I, I think they did, but there was also issues with supplies of shells, and sometimes the ships don't have the most modern shells, and all sorts of fun things are going on. So there's in, some really interesting accounts around that of what they should have and what they do have, so I'm not really... I'm, I'm sort of giving that an open-ended answer. Um, how's the fast finding situation going? It's... We've got. I've, I've. We spotted some nice properties. We're hoping to do some video viewings this week, um, and if so, I will be heading down there, which could cause an interesting thing next weekend because I doubt I could go down during the week this week when it's an in, in because I've got commitments on Friday night, etc., and of course Thursday's live, so things could get inter interesting. Wow, there's a lot of wind going on outside. Andrew Brother, how much could the World War I German 14 inch guns have been uh, that were never fitted to as that's York help if played as in a dual turret replacing triples of Jutland? Um, if you have the triples and you do replace them with them, then they could be useful. They would give them more firepower. But the trouble is. Anything the Germans do, and remember the Germans have far less infrastructure than the British do to do this. So, if the Germans start doing that, the British will respond. And the British can do it far more and far more quickly. So that's the problem for the Germans. If the Germans do that, okay, fine, that's another, that's another, the Germans are doing it. The British will respond. What do the 14-inch guns? They give them more firepower equivalent to the 13.5-inch and, and definitely the 12-inch ships. They're not going to meet them. They're not going to equal the 15-inch ships. But if they're putting the efforts into that, then they've got those weapons. They've got those inf infrastructure. And those things going down that way. Probably actually, actually ends up delaying Jutland happening. And delaying Jutland does not work in the German saver because yes, they can up the guns, but the British could be upping the guns on their ships as well. And while the British are doing that, they're also getting things like renown, repulse, and the remaining R class, etc., into service. Hello, Steve Clark. 
I haven't managed to record Bill Trump's 125 yet. Not yet, but was going to get there. We have plans. We keep trying to arrange it so we get Sal Mercargus along with us as well. And it's proving fun to coordinate four diaries. If capital ship limit is 45,000 tons of Washington with 10, 10, 7, 4, 7, 4, 4, who had it worse? The French or the Italians for trying to build or afford ships of the size? Um, under that scenario, I think you mean total numbers will be 20, 20, 14, and 8, and 8. Uh, the British and the Americans have a massive advantage in that scenario, especially when you consider how many of those ships they can build with their existing tonnage, because they, if you're allowed 20, 45,000 ton ships, you're allowed a cumulative tonnage of 900,000 tons, uh, standard. And if you're allowed 900,000 tons in standard, then things are good. Um... I'm deciding I haven't had enough iron brew, so I'm drinking some more. And if it's the well, French and the Italians, they're both going to be in an interesting scenario. But with eight ships as their limit, they could have more ships in service. So honestly, if you've got eight ships in your limit, the, ja the Italians might actually finish off the Francisco Caracola. They might not finish off her sisters, but they might well finish off the Francisco Caracola just to try and upgrade their numbers because they would otherwise be short battleships. Probably the people in the worst position are going to be the French. Mainly because of the French government. Not because of the French. The French government. This is one of the other things which I get into trouble on this channel and I do find it annoying. Well, not really annoying, but how do I put this? Frustrating. Um... The amount of people who think sometimes I'm just be I'm being rude about the French or the Americans when I'm being rude about their governments. It's not America that's at fault for, their US na for the US Navy not being the same size as the Royal Navy in 1939. It's the US Congress. It's their lack of funding. They did they have a treaty allowance. I have to. I do admit it was the British entire grand plan, and that's something that people often forget. Is the British realised that the Americans wanted to be equal to them in and wanted to be equal to them, but would settle for being equal for them in paper, on paper, without being equal to them in reality. And for the British, that was a far cheaper, far easier win. They honestly didn't think much of Wilson's construction would survive his death and Tillman's death. But they didn't know if it would, and frankly, they didn't want to. Have, they wanted to say, be able to save and focus on other things, so they did. Almost my name. Should there be a new HMS Hood? That's a tough one. We start down the Admiral's route. I think so, but just picking it as a random name in a class, I prefer not. You start down the Admiral's route and you start having Admirals regularly associated with level. Let's say we decide that we're going to, from now on, all destroyers are going to be named after Admirals. Then work through them and then when you come to Hood, it's Hood's turn. Will I do videos on those carriers in the Pacific? Probably. So you've got the choice between muzzle velocity and shell weight was one which concerned many navies. There is no perfect solution. However, what does history back up as the best? Getting the, the mixture right. Having the right shell weight at the right muzzle velocity to cause the maximum amount of damage pound for pound. And there is a whole debate about that. But honestly, you can't really pick one or the other. If you go purely for muzzle velocity and you want the fastest moving shell you can, that's great. That's going to have a lot of kinetic energy impact. But it's probably not going to have a go as good an impact in terms of explosive. And going for something which is all about shell size is probably going to have good things about explosive, but less thing, good things about muzzle velocity and speed of impact. So, force equals mass times acceleration. You've got to get both the mass and the acceleration right to give you the maximum force on impact. How long until Drax patron questions video parts in total is 10 hours long? Not sure, but it's coming. I remember reading HMS Earth Australia firing 8 inch guns at aircraft formations in the Philippines. Was she using proximity fuses of 8 inch shells? Uh, I don't think she had proximity fuses. I think she was using timed shells. 
I think they were timing them to go off because they were they were high explosive shells and they had a timing for them to go off or something like that. Not sure. Maybe they had proximity. But um, yeah, she could angle her guns up to 70 degrees. So yes, they were using the 8-inch guns for AA, which scared the bejesus out of the Americans who were just going, What the frigate? Use 8-inch guns for anti-aircraft fire? It works. It's able to angle up to 70 degrees. Yes, but that... That's not fair! What you consider overkill, we consider a Tuesday. Um, Captain did these haven't even had the money to finish off the carrier Carlos? Yes, they did. They could have finished off Francisco. Uh, she was already launched, remember? So she could have been finished off. It wouldn't have been quick, but they could have done it. I would have probably finished off the other three if they'd taken their time about it. Um, it's just where you want to prioritise your spending. Yes, you mentioned before larger guns for common production is a better idea. Just keep forgetting or thinking that more faster ships guns are better. Although a heavy with um, would be beneficial as it to have. That said, one is none that, ne that, that it need two heavies plus four lights plus four to six destroyers, sloops, corvettes, and ran out the tassels of my mind. You usually do need a mixture. Yeah, I, I did need a top of a rope. Captain did the Italians ever have the money to finish the Caracolas on so on? I said to would it be right that the names of the Frames Vizzles and Vapagot were not going to be used on the G freezers? Two of those were that lost catastrophically. No, they weren't. They were going, That wasn't even a consideration. They were into the Admiral's phase. The Royal Navy was into the naming things after Admiral's phase of its, de of its design development of, of capital ships. It goes through phases. It goes the great name phase, and then it has the admiral phase, and then it has the great name phase, and it has the admiral phase. Then it has the great name phase, and it has the admiral phase. You can see that if you look at the Royal Navy, because they do, if you look at that, sort of the Royal Navy is in the great name phase, and then they suddenly get to admirals, which basically starts with the admiral class. Then they start off with them, uh, the admiral, and then it's Nelson and Rodney. And then, yes, there's King George V and Prince of Wales, but and Duke of York, but there's Anson and Howe, which are admirals. And then there's Vanguard, which is the great names phase. And so, basically, you have that. So, I, I'm firmly of the belief the G-3s and N-3s were going to be were going to be admirals. Not anything else, because, frankly, the admirals, it works, uh, for, works better for the Royal Navy. As I said before, saint names are incredibly unlikely in Royal Navy history. They they are very attractive to a certain group of people to try and suggest they are going to be saint names, and those people are often looking at it with an eye an eye to things like I, I remember once one some person going, but it would fit in with when the saint goes marching in, which was popular in the 1920s. A that's after the ship was bought, the ships were being ordered, so that's going to have no impact, and B. The Royal Navy has long been known to take notice of what songs are popular in music halls and churches for when what's the naming of its ships. I mean, the Ship Naming Committee, which is full up of people who have usually served in the Royal Navy for roughly 30 to 40 years, are really the type of people who are going to go, we are going down to the music halls and listening to the music. Oh, that's a rip-roaring song. Let's go and have named the ship Saints. So when the Saints come sailing in, yeah, yeah. They're that sort of, no, they're not. You know, in the nicest way, you're lucky if you get them out of the pub. Um, more likely they're at the country, they're at country piles doing fox hunting and grouse shooting they're not going to be down the music halls taking any notice of what's going on there they barely take any notice of the British government British ministers have barely any input into that. They, they, the ministers try and say, just look at how many times Churchill fails to name ships at certain points the Royal Navy honestly give him a win just because they're feeling guilty for turning him down so often not happening. <sighs> Bell Galactica. No question, Doctor. What led to the Iran Navy to move from the Hawkins single 7.5-inch gun to the twin 8-inch gun? 
What's there no development of twin? Maybe it's triple seven and a half inch gun. Uh, a eight inch gun became the treaty limit, so of course they're going to go with eight inch guns. And B, they had the twin turrets on the on the E class HMS uh, HMS um, Enterprise. So they had a twin turret design. They had the eight inch guns. That's what they went for, and it fitted within the tonnage. Because, again, the Ronave was at that time where they were debating still number of turrets versus number of guns. Because the idea was, well, if you have four turrets and one gets hit, you only lost 25% of your firepower. Whereas if you have three turrets and one gets hit, you lost 30% of your firepower. So that's a real consideration of battle survivability. And when you're talking about limitations of armor you have in the terms of the treaty limits, that's an impact. Henry Buffett, I agree completely, UK, we did not build over on the capitals, but they, would they really build triples if Germany's building 12-inch ships and they are building 13.5-inch ships? Yeah. Henry Bur uh, Hendrik Buffett, you have to remember ha just how petty the UK Admiralty is at certain points. They wanted to have the most, the biggest, the best. And they, needed, they wanted to do the best in every category. Now, partly they needed it because they needed to be the ones setting the tone. Uh, but they could afford with the Americans, etc., to ignore it because that's a qualitative battle, uh, a, quanti a qualitative battle. But when the Germans are engaging you in a quantitative battle, i.e., numbers get battle, and then they start making a qualitative change, i.e., triple turrets instead of twin turrets, but not dropping the number of turrets, then the British are going to respond because that's part of the qualitative, uh, the quantitative battle. So the thing is, the British will respond to the Germans doing triple turrets. No one else doing it. The Austro-Hungarians do triple turrets. That doesn't even register really on the British as a blip. The Americans do all sorts of things. That doesn't register as a blip. The Germans did it. That would have been a blip. Because the Germans are in a quantitative race with the British. The Americans, the Italians, Japanese, honorable mentions to the Austro-Hungarians and the French are in a qualitative race, i.e. the quality race. So that's the difference. Um, Andrew Buffer, what name is most likely to name a submarine Apostle John the Baptiste? The Spanish. I take it from how much larger does the regular class need to be to get a 5 triple 6 inch secondary battery and 12 100 millimeter guns? Uh, it's not that much larger, but depends. Do you want to keep the other characteristics the same? If the Nelson class are allowed to build 45,000 tons and they're built to an F3 star layout, how fast could they go to be des or could they be designed to go? Um, let's see. Honestly, you probably are talking about a 30 knot ship. If it's F3 design. With 16 inch guns. Yeah, that, that's probably F3, a 30 knot ship at 45,000 tons. And that's, that's worrying. Because that's faster than some battle crews around that time. And name wise, Lion, Unicorn, Dragon. Um, well, yeah, but the Lion class are into the great name phase, but they're not built, so I can't really include them, so I have to go with Vanguard. But again, the Lion class come after Anson and Howe. Dragon is an interesting formation. Unicorn is, uh... Hmm? The carriers go into the great name phase before the capital ships, but that's because capital ships are capital ships. They're all slightly, spe slightly special. Let's see, there's some stuff going on in the chat. Let's uh, have a look at this. 
Well, both Galactica, but indeed, both 7.5 inch and 9.2 are being used by the Royal Navy. It's just interesting. None will progress further after World War One, and the 18 was plonked into the equation. Oh, that's very simple. That's the treaty limits. The treaty limits are based around Hawkins class, and it's round up to 8 inch. So basically, the treaty limitation is entirely based. Uh, the treaty limitation for uh, cruisers, isn't it? Uh, cruisers and their vessels below, is in, in the Washington Treaty, is entirely based on the Hawkins class. So they up the from seven and a half inch to eight inch, and they take it to ten thousand tons standard. It's literally the Hawkins class. Um. The Hawkins were 9,960 to 10,020 tons in standard. Uh, they were armed with 7.5 inch guns, and so that's where you get your 10,000 ton standard limitation and your 8 inch gun limitation, or rather 8.1 inch. So it's entirely treaty limitations. I don't have a reduction. Let's look it up because I haven't looked up the Breju one one twenty in a while, long while. So I'm going to look up its stats. Let's go to Secret Projects Forum. Let's see. No, actually, let's not go there. Let's go to Military Factory. That's probably better for this one. Because I want the stats, not the debate. Yeah, da da da. Da 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 da. I don't want that. I want power and performance. Okay. It can go supersonic. That's good. Turbojet structural, fairly decent size. Okay, let's consider its armament. Okay. Mmm. Well, military factory, a factory, give it a 66 out of 100, so that's not bad. And it's got fairly good altitude. It's not actually built. Or is it me, or does it look a bit like a tornado? It's an interesting one to ask about, because I think it had the potential to be a good aircraft, but of course, they don't finish its development, so we can't really be sure, but for, it's only got the good ingredients for one. It's only got a good power-to-weight ratio, and it's got a good ability, good ability to carry, carry stuff, and it looks like it has the ability to upgrade it. So I'd say, overall, the the British 1120 Sirocco could have been a very good naval fighter, but we all never know, because they didn't really develop it enough. <coughs> nice to hear from. What is the most disturbing thing you've seen on social media? Um, not something I talk about on YouTube. But I end up going some interesting places on social media. And by that I mean... I've worked in groups and with organizations which look into things like claims of genocide. So, yeah, there are some dark places in social media and various forms of social media around the world where people will post what they're doing. You really don't want to see that. In terms of naval history, there's the constant discussions of whether Bismarck would win a battle versus the Iowa class, and the question and the answer is nope. 
That doesn't even need to be debated. If it managed to golden BB it like it did Hood, yeah, yes. But the chances of that happening are like the chances of Hood are millions to one. Um, so yeah, it's not absolutely no, but the odds are very, very low. Uh, the, the odds are the Iowa wins the battle versus Bismarck without even blinking. Um, Captain Steve, given the recent alpha, uh, the recent R in alphabet class have had one animal's name per class, if your shoot name is successful as a B class, which animal would it be? Blake, Bembo, Bosquin, Barham, Bridgem, BT? Um, Bembo is a fairly common one uh, in history, and Barham is also quite common to come up. And Barham, they quite they quite like going for capital ship names for um, uh, those, those sort of things. But of course, currently we have Duncan in service in Type 45s. Um... I'm sorry, if the spearfish had not been axed, does 1947 or 48 seem right for its entering service after all bugs are fixed? Lean into the 48. 47 seems a bit over enthusiastic. Tim Clark, question. I think we get too much information now if we break this down. What are the best historical combinations in the ship design for each ship classification? Battleship, battlecruiser, CV, A, CVL, CA. Like uh, CLDDFF. That's an entire massive video. If you want to suggest that as a Patreon video, yes, please go ahead. But that's not something you can answer quickly. Because you have to explain your mechanism for analyzing before you do. It strikes as being the Mirage F1 before Mirage F1. Yeah, it's the same. Seven. Oh, the flags. Um, what's that from? Flags didn't show up. It was England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland names to represent each one. Not really. No. Dragon is often associated with the Welsh. Unicorn, not really. And lion, not really with England and Scot England and Scotland. They they can do, and um, but they're not really associated. Those names really aren't associated with them. Again, the Royal Navy doesn't like to... There has... <clears throat> there has only ever been one HMS England. Um, 1693. And she was sunk. And from that point onwards, the Royal Navy has had a very strong tradition of not naming ships for things which, if they're sunk, it's going to cause a problem. It's one of the reasons why, again, if you look at the history of, let's say, HMS St. George, it's very much not something which comes up. Uh, and the Royal Navy, you'd think, patron saint of the country, you'd think that would be a rather a lot for the Royal Navy... There have been, well, there have been seven, and there has not been an actual vessel in service since the Edgar class vessel of that name was scrapped in 1920. In 1920, St. George's, uh, St. George's is cancelled, is scrapped. Um, the shore establishment is built upon the Isle of Man that was set up in 1939. Is was called, was called HMS St George, but no, the Royal Navy. Um... And prior to that, there'd been prior to the St George of the Edgar class as a 120 gun first rate. It's just yeah, one of those St Georges, one of those. Vessels I sort of talked to about the sort of eighth one was originally Britannia, then renamed Princess Royal, then St. George, and then Barfleur. In fact, goes through so much of a history, it's beyond belief. The, and that's the patron saint of England. Once you get onto St. Patrick or any of the other saints, the Royal Navy is even worse. The Royal Navy doesn't like patron saints, it smacks of three things uh, popish, uh, popishness, popish, uh, popism. Um, it smacks of what their enemies do, the Spanish and the French, and 
it's also a risk in that if you have a ship which is named for, let's say, St. Patrick and it gets sunk, then is it an insult to the Irish? Is it an insult to the... It just causes trouble. So the, the Royal Navy really don't like saint names for their ships. Honestly, if you look at the battle that goes on every time they have a ship named St. George, it's pretty much forcing them by, to an extent, the British go the government. And they really have to force them. And they're not, the British government are not, are not going to force them for four saint names. That's just going to cause issues. Because that is going to smack of popism, uh, popism and popishness. And frankly... I'm new, and please note, I'm not being rude to Catholics. Please note, I'm using the phrase they'd use at the time. And they... Papism, Popism. They, they, they'd usually say Popism and Popishness. Um, they, they really don't like that. They are... Even the ones who are Catholic are virulently anti-looking Catholic. It's fun to read some of the papers. Would Luchin still be in charge if Bismarck, Turpit, Sharnos, Nicer are all involved in Operation Rheinberg? Probably. In fact, more than likely because of his seniority and his role. Uh, Nicer, would you agree it's unfair to compare the Spearfish to the Avenger? Mm. Yes and no. They were contemporaneous, so it does make sense, but they're also different generations. Hendrik Bofer, if British Action of Monk is built with three triples in historic otherwise. Um, let me just check the exact time time. The Motka. So if the Motka class are built, which are Motka and Goban, are built with triples in ordered in 1911. So they then go up from... They have 10 guns. If they are built with 5 triple turrets, so they have 15 guns, otherwise in the original, the British probably uh, mirror that. So there'll be battle cruisers which would have the mirror. So whichever of the battle cruisers the British build, I think, are the. We're looking at the 1912-1913 orders. You'd be looking at probably Queen Mary and Tiger could well have triple turrets, and the renowned class might well have uh, the renowns and renowns the Queen Elizabeths and the Rs would probably have triple turrets. That would probably be the British response, because if you consider the timeline, those are the vessels they'd respond with. So the Queen Elizabeth would have 12 15-inch guns. That would be the British response. Which would be a very interesting response, because let's be honest, if the Queen Elizabeth class are designed to 12 15-inch guns in triple turrets, they have to be longer to maintain the same Q efficient uh, for their hulls, but B... They're going to be wider because they're also going to be slightly beamier for that. So you could end up with the Machi being 28 knot ships because they have the space for that on the on the the um, pass uh, the the space they could take. Honestly, the Queen Elizabeth class could be absolute frigging monsters. You type three triples, only nine guns. Oh, if they have only nine guns, yes. I'm sorry. Hendrik Bofa, I can understand why you're saying that and why you're asking it, but the thing is, the British are going to respond. They are pe they aren't. It's not so much, as I said, petty enough to an extent, but also it's the British cannot afford. In a, if they see the Amer the Germans going with nine uh, with triple turrets, they're going to presume their next generation of battleships are going. Their dreadnoughts are going to go with triple turrets. They're going to presume that. So the Queen Elizabeth class are the minimum are going to be triple turrets. The R's probably are going to be triple turrets. And Queen Mary and Tiger will most likely... Queen Mary, probably, Tiger definitely will be triple turrets. Tiger will probably still have four triple uh, four turrets. So Tiger will probably still have the ability... It will have 12 guns. 
And I know it seems strange to say it, but the British can afford to. Their infrastructure and their funding, for them, okay, yes, it's more expensive, but it's not so much more expensive. And also, again, the thing you have to remember is the British have triple turrets. They are developing triple turrets. They have triple turrets ready to go. So they have triple turret designs they can build upon and use. <coughs> They're keeping the twin turrets as they are because the twin turrets offer that survivability, as I talked about. It's the, you know, you lose a turret, you lose this much firepower. Well, the British would just go, right then, so we still want to have that survivability, but they're prepared to drop down to four turrets for the Queen of Zealand. Anyway, if they can go to four triple turrets, then they're really happy. Because they still lose only 25% of the firepower if one sh one turret goes. But now they've got, they they are down to nine guns instead of 12, uh, they're down to nine, nine guns on their broadside. And their total broadside is 12. The main problem with that is going to be what the American reaction will be. That's the main thing the British are going to be worried about. You said free triples. You did. I sorry, I misread, I misread that. Um, nice. Turn Would I be right to think that Type Twenty One Amazon class frigates were designed for overseas presence missions? They are not really designed by the government. They're sort of designed by commercial companies to as a light frigate to offer the Royal Navy and other navies. And the Royal Navy goes, "Yep, we're a shortage. We haven't got a design ready to go. We'll take that design, modify, and use it." So yeah, they're going to be used for overseas presence missions. They're going to be used for lots of things, but they are there for that. Ba -da -da -da. Um, that message. Everyone in the battle watching the naval treaty is allowed to build four seventy thousand ton battle cruisers. What monstrosities are built by everyone? Oh, frigate! Who knows? Honestly, if you're allowing them to build seventy thousand tons and sixty inch guns, goodness knows who knows what they build. Most of them couldn't build that. America and Britain are pretty much the only yard, are only ones which have yards which could build that at that time. The Japanese could probably build something up to that level, but that would take time and, and to invest in infrastructure as it did to get the uh, Yamatos. And if everyone can build four, goodness knows what they build. It'll probably be something festooned with 16-inch guns. Um, if we consider the G threes, that's forty nine thousand two hundred tons in normal, let alone in standard. If you've got seventy thousand tons in standard, you're ba oh, you're almost doubling your say, your capacity. So it's colossal. Right, thanks for everyone. Would I be right that the Republic of China wanted to build their eight 1913 battlecruisers that I mentioned earlier that had the Republic of China? The British are the only choice that they'd have to get it built overseas. You could theoretically order them split the order between Britain and America, but pretty much their only chance of actually getting them built at any point of Britain and America. They haven't got the yards themselves and experience to build them at the time. They're very complicated assets. And the only people who have enough yards that can build those things in enough quantities are Britain and America. And let's be honest, Britain's got more yards than America at this point. And we're talking about 1913. Can a ship like Trieste be used as a carrier support ship, like Unicorn for the Queen Elizabeth? Yes. Um... Nice to go, everyone. We, uh, I'm going to have another conversation about loaded language in a second. Um, because you've done it a couple of times, and I haven't bothered to raise up because I already discussed it last week. But this one's, again, another one. Would it be fair to call the literal combat ships a bullet that the USN really did not need to take? Really? Look, the literal combat ship is a long story. It's kind of the US Navy's equivalent of the Bradley. And the idea was to try and make something which could go everywhere, be everything to all people. And it's more difficult to do that in a ship when you're talking thousands of tons than when you're talking about a armoured personnel carrier. Because at a base point, everyone knows what an armoured personnel carrier is. 
But the moment you try and step away from the idea of a frigate or a destroyer and you're building something new, you no longer have a fixed guideline and you have thousands of tons to play with and everyone thinks their idea can fit in. And it can't. That was the first problem the literal combat ship, the moment they called it the LCS rather than a frigate. If they called it the literal frigate, literal combat frigate rather than literal combat ship, they would have had a, sta they would have had a leg to stand on. The moment they tried to go, uh, go completely something new, then you needed one of two. Uh, you needed something to succeed. You needed a very, very strong person with a very strong vision, a la Rickover, Rickover, to be in charge of the project and to be absolute authority. If you don't have that and you don't have a guideline by which to hold it to, you end up with what happens in the LCS, which is a runaway program, which go, which has all sorts of issues built into it because of compromises made so that people could get their personal pet projects put in. That's your problem. That's why navies keep to. That's why when Britain was built, Britain was talking about future combat ship, and then suddenly future combat ship merged into Type Twenty Six frigate, Type Thirty One frigate, Type Eighty Three destroyer. There is a reason for that. When it's in the concept level, it can be your future combat ship. When it's in the we need to order it level, you either need to have one person who's the authority to hold to the original vision. Or you need to have a vision that you can hold everyone to collectively. So it needs frigate or destroyer or cruiser. Something which people know and understand what it is. Oh, um, there was a newspaper panic in the early 1910s when the Italy and Australia Hungary started to build triple twelves, but there was the RN panicking. The RN didn't panic at that point because they don't mind those two powers having triples. They'd have a sheer, they'd have a definite qualitative, a quantitative advantage over them, and they are part of the sort of part of the qualitative race anyway. So it was kind of interesting to see it. It's different once you have the quantitative race. This is what I keep trying to make explain. There's a difference between responding in the qualitative race versus in the quantitative race. The quantitative race is someone is trying to build up as enough numbers to beat you. When the basically the British would see that the Germans were trying to would would think if the Germans were going for triple turrets in the Moltke class would sit there and go right, and they've realised they can't necessarily beat us in numbers of ships because we can outbuild them. So now they're going to outgun us by having more guns than we uh, than we have by having triples rather than twins to make up for the different disparity in the gun numbers. Okay, we're going to match that. That's the literal thought process that would go for a British, uh, the British Third Sea Lord and the First Sea Lord's heads. Heads. The Germans have are building triple turret ships now. They are challenging us to a quantitative race on ships and ship numbers. Okay, we'll beat beat that. The only way we know how by having more uh, by uh, uh, by matching it. Siglock, if you sort the position and facilities of the Australian and Austrian German navies over in World War One, what changes? If you swap the position and facilities of the Austrian and German navies, uh, you, well, the Austrian navy, I would say, it always has a clearer vision of what ships they want. Um, it's not a position and facilities though that really undermine the Germans or really undermine the Austrians. It's the fact that they are la their their armies are always going to be the focus of defending, so they're always services which always come second in defending and all the route. And that's basically, as I've said before, the way the British win the Dreadnought race against the Germans is the Queen Elizabeth class and the Arts because they raise the cost that much of competing with the British that it's affecting the army budget. And the moment it affects the army budget, the army's going to stamp down on the on the Kaiserling Marine, and that's the I've discussed that before. I said, um, but what broadly changes? Not much. 
Selective Glass, the Germans, if they were in the same position as the Austrians, probably go a similar route. And the Austrians, if they're in the same position as the Germans, probably go a similar route. There are some interesting differences, but, you know, probably you're going to see, you will see triple turrets, and more often, because the, the Austrians do think about firepower. But tomorrow's stats are a product of their thinking about dealing with the Italians. So there is that product in there. Um... So I know I know it's a motive language, but I hate uh, but I hate the literal combat ship. They're a waste of money, and are an example lesson that HMS Captain should have taught everyone. Mm, yes, no. As I said, I, I tried to explain the problem with the LCS. It's the moment you call it literal combat ship, you've marooned it from everything else, and that may, gives it a problem. Let's see, everyone. So, question 18. So, if the 8th of November 2008, the USN had started getting Constellation class guiding missile fragments instead of those for concepts, would the USN be in a better place and happier? Yes and yes. Because the Constellation class frigates guided uh, GMC uh, uh, class um, guided missile frigates have a clear vision and a clear path of what they're supposed to be expected to and follow from. And they would have been a nice follow-on from the OHPs. And that's really what the Americans were looking for, a follow-on for the OHPs. That would be able to do things like mine sweeping, etc. Carl Gersberg. So the Royal Navy only would have started to really act when Italy and Austria Hungary were, were to hold joint exercise south of Italy and the Francisco Caracolas and Monarchs came out. Um, if that happened, let's say, so if World War One holds off long enough for the Francisco Caracolas to be built and the Ezat Monarchs to be built, and Italy and Austria do not go into war in that time, considering their relationship and then they hold a joint exercise and they have those capability ships the british are going to look at that but also what are the ships going to have and the british are going to have in that time because if the british have built the r's what have they built after the r's because that's the thing you've got to think about in the time it takes for those ships to come on service how many ships have the british built what ships are the british up 16 and a half inch gun ships 18 inch gun ships Don Giovanni, is there anything stopping the Germans from sending their naval architects to the other axis and designing Bismarck with Italian derived triple 15 inch? Nope. Just German ego. That's literally that's what the, what's causing the trouble. So basically, it's uh, the Don Giovanni. The issue there is Germany, not anyone else. The I'm sure actually Mussolini might have actually enjoyed him coming there to have a look at his ships and bask in his glory and see how great his ships were. And I say, everyone, wouldn't Scarborough Flow, if it was used as a military base, again, need years or years to be brought up to modern standards? Depends what kind of base you're using as. If you want it to be a yard equivalent, a facility equivalent to Plymouth and Portsmouth, yes. If you want it to be used as Scarborough Flow was used, which was a forward fleet base, it's mm, probably not years, but it wouldn't be quick or cheap. Right, I'm up to second book. So, yay, Okinawa, the last of naval battles of World War II. And by my count... I am um, mm. Let's see. I'm at 028 0218 roughly. And by my account, so I'm going to put that in as the timing for the uh, Okinawa coming on. So, this book. It's again compiled by John Graham, Graham, who basically spends his time doing this, and it's a really good work. Um, he has taken what is Battle Summary number 47, aka ADM 234368, the naval operations in assault and capture of Okinawa, Operation Iceberg, March to June 1945, and has turned it with as much accuracy as possible into this book.
The three ba Japanese battleships, two battleship, uh, two battleship carriers, Ize and Higa, each of which still mounted eight 14-inch guns, after the removal of their after turrets for the fitting of the flight decks, with two heavy and two light cruisers and 25 destroyers, comprise the second fleet of the first division or first uh, first division attack force under Vice Admiral Ito. And their three other battleships were Yamato, Nagato, and Hrana. It's interesting to note that the British, in this point, say that the actually of the of, uh, the four of these, only the former alone, Yamato, could be considered comparable to the ten great mo America, modern American battleships of the Iowa, South Dakota, and North Carolina classes, and to King George V and Howe of the British Pacific Fleet, which was to take part in the operation. Um, the Gi Japanese Third Fleet, Vice Admiral Jisaburo Osora, had four carriers and one escort carrier, and they were still afloat. The Hayakta, a junior class, which had been heavily damaged on 9th December 1944 off Nagasaki and was still out of action. The Ryuo, which suffered heavy damage on 19th March 1945, always go 19th March, at Kyo during the preliminary operations by US and fast carrier aircraft in connection with the assault on Okinawa. But the Japanese carriers were inoperative through lack of air groups. In fact, the entire combined fleet was practically immobilized through lack of oil. The 6th Fleet, Vice Admiral Shigeyoshi Miwa, disposed of some 15 operational disposed of some 15 operational submarines the enemy had made little offensive use of this weapon during the war in the present operation it was assumed the enemy submarines would be active along the uh, allied supply routes and such allied escorts as were available were used up to the maximum in the waters nearest the japanese submarine bases and operating areas but no movement was ever cancelled for lack of escorts when these were not available some risk was accepted it was, however, the midget submarines and suicide craft which would be encountered in the operation air objective area. And indeed, suicide boats were encountered in large numbers in the course of the operation. Although the measures taken against them nullified their effect. Seven Allied ships were damaged and one sunk by suicide boats out of a total of 371 and 36 respectively, by all means. Uh, it was believed that the greater part of the enemy's naval strength would be based in Japan at the commencement of the operation. And that whilst he would not commit his major service units, hit and run raids on the amphibious forces were a distinct possibility. Now. It's an interesting, interesting work and gives you a lot of interesting details. It's really something I've enjoyed reading. I've enjoyed working through. Again, it has pictures in it. Bomb and torpedo hits on Yamato. I do love that sketch. You can see that is such a hand-drawn, quick sketch to work this out that's been reproduced. You can imagine the person reading this who would draw that going, No! Why have you used my diagram? That's a terrible diagram. I drew that quickly for personal notes. That's not supposed to be in an official document. You can just imagine the poor person going, Aah! and then we got pictures. There's a fair number of those. There you go. It's a very cool book. And a very useful book. Andrew Beaufort, to my knowledge, only Italian battleships upgraded from the caliber of guns. Why do you suppose this is? Because, honestly, the Jap and the Italian guns weren't great. And it's basically, it's the Italians go that route, but the British and Americans are looking at it thinking, is it better to go that route? Is it better to upgrade other ships? Is it better to do... The British want to keep the 15-inch guns, and that's the main thing. That's sort of... I think the British would have upgraded to 15 inch guns if they'd gone the 15 inch 50 route on the F with the F3 design instead of the nail rods, or if they'd gone the 15 inch route for a 15 inch 45, 15 inch 48 
for the um, King George uh, for the King George V, and then they would have upgraded it. But otherwise, they were just going to leave it be because the 15 inch 42 worked fine for them. They did upgrade the 15 inch 42. They did work on that. They gave it better, uh, and they gave it um, so improvements in terms of its mechanisms and etc. And explosives and the systems being used on it and shells being used on it, but they didn't see any need to actually upgrade the gun. Question 16. Is a 13,000 ton light carrier with one York and county and uh, county and two Leander facing Grass Bay the intended matchup for the Iron's anti commerce hunting groups? Um, that certainly wouldn't upset them. I don't think the RM was planning on a 13,000 ton light carrier specifically. You could argue, if you looked at the Hermi, Hermes, uh, that they were considering an 11,000 ton vessel. Maybe 12,000 ton would have been where it would end up, but I don't think... 13,000 tons doesn't sound like a derivative of a unicorn class, and it doesn't sound like a derivative of a Hermes class either. It just sounds like a random figure. If the Iceland was where the Azores were, but still settled by Vikings at about the same time as originally, what impact would this have, especially on the colonization of the Americas? If it's settled by Vikings, depends. If they're still a Christian Vi Viking state, does Portugal conquer them, or do they leave them alone? Um, the thing is about Iceland is it managed to stay relatively underarmed and unaffected because of part of where it was in the world. No one was really going up there. If you talk about the Azores, that's going to be in a vital shipping lane. There is a real problem with who might end up in control of that. There's almost an argument that the British end up in control of it, because if the Spanish end up in control of it, because the Portuguese take it off the Danish, and then the Spanish will try and take it off the Portuguese, and there'll be a huge war that. The British will probably take it off the, Port the Spanish at the same time as take Gibraltar. I doubt they give the Azores back, if they've got, they got it as well as Gibraltar. In which case... That could have been a real. It could be a really interesting member of the Commonwealth now, or even could be part of the UK. Strangely enough, actually, I could see that one working out. But it would certainly have changed World War One and World War Two because the British would have had a very secure base to operate from. I'm sorry. Correct me if I'm wrong, but wouldn't the Grass Bay be decimated by Royal Navy carrier strikes and finish off by two uh, heavy cruisers and two light cruisers and then destroyed? Honestly, Knight 6 everyone, I'm not sure where you're going with that. You're, you, you've you put in a hypothetical light cruiser, which I like carrier, which I don't know the operating characteristics of. Because um, let's be honest, it could be a 13,000 ton ship, but that's going to be an interesting design of what, whatever, how many aircraft can it carry, how can, well does it, does its sustainment go. And then you've asked me the question of, wouldn't the Graf Spey be decimated by the Royal Navy carrier strikes? Potentially, but potentially they could miss. Potentially it could be really rough weather and they couldn't launch. You know, that's the whole discussion. And then finish off by the two heavy cruisers and two light cruisers. Well, they're, well, let's be honest, considering how it performed against one of the lighter uh, heavy cruisers and two Leanders, then frankly having a full fat county there as well is, just seems overkill. And then you've got it destroying turpits with one, one cruiser, two light cruisers and one DD sending a message. Uh, I, I, I have... Uh, I'm not sure where that comes in. Because you've suddenly got turpits there and all the things. That seems almost like you've combined questions somehow. Here's Clark. Okay, I know you can't comment on some aspects of current affairs. What do you think the Iranian aims are in the current proxy war in Red Sea? What are they expecting to achieve? The question you are you need to ask is what do they hope to achieve versus what do they expect to achieve. And honestly, they could be hoping to raise the cost of things out there so much that people withdraw. That people, let's put it this way: I do not think Iran is really thinking that Israel is going to disappear. I don't think they're on that uh, that requirement. I think myself, from my reading the situation. Iran is hoping that a situation comes around that 
the a lot of nations get fed up with the Middle East and ignore it because then Iran has a chance or changing the narrative around it but also you have to remember that quite a lot of what they do is for their domestic consumption and their own uh, political in terms of aims which is of course to wound a great Satan and others and I don't think this campaign is particularly working well for them, because whilst it is raising costs of insurance rates, there's also the problem that it might actually be finally drumming home to most Western governments that you need to change things. I do know the Type 83 is going through many, many revisions. I do know there are the Type 31s, of course, have had the Mark 41 VLS put in, start installed in their design already, as a minimum for the five vessels coming through. Um, the Type 26s are also probably going to be facing modif modifications. And there's all sorts of things. And actually, that governments might end up having to spend more on defense because of it. Honestly, the thing was, if Russia, Iran, others have been prepared to wait a little bit longer, keep quiet a little bit longer, the West was doing a very good job of disarming itself and disarming itself below a level which it couldn't be mounting these campaigns. It couldn't be supporting Ukraine. It couldn't be doing this. And whilst, yes, there are some very stupid, silly, penny-smart, pound-foolish decisions being made in terms of um, frigate numbers, etc., as we speak in Britain and in other nations, the reality is that it's changed the conversation enough that it's going to cause trouble for people who are having pushing a more disarmament focus. Especially Germany is a good example of this. Germany was pretty much disarming itself unilaterally. It was quietly doing it, but honestly, Germany was well on the route to having nothing. And now, suddenly, they have to have something, and they, they feel they have to have something. And all sorts of things are coming back in Germany. And, to be honest, Britain, France, Italy... Italy's done better than most, but Italy has a very short leash on its very large dog. And the thing is, it's going to have to start lengthening that leash, and you're going to see that. But the trouble is, we are still living, and we will be living for the next most of the next decade, with the consequences of the thinking of the 1990s and 2000s, and even the 2010s, where by, for 30 years, people honestly, for most 30 years, people honestly believed that any future war was going to be a war of choice. That if the West didn't choose to fight that war, it wouldn't happen. They believed themselves the power of gods, to decide the fate of all. Not just the people they were led, they were put in charge of to lead, but to decide the world. That is a power not reserved for mortal ma mortal, uh, mortals. It is a power reserved for far more supreme beings. Fate, whatever you want to call it. Luck, hubris, all those things. And that's the problem. Take care, Richard. A Duke Petrion, we're not going to see a Type 47 and Type 83. In the nicest way, anyone talking about that is going to get you into trouble, because if you start building anything cheaper, they'll build that. Remember that happened? That's the Type 42 versus Type 82, right? What happens? Type 82 gets won, Type 42 gets built in the class. If you put forward a Type 47 and the a Treasury and the government latch onto that as a cheaper way of getting the numbers so they can say they have the numbers of ships without actually getting the ships, they will do that. So basically, if the quickest way you want to undermine the Royal Navy or undermine any naval procurement at this point, start, to, start putting forward that as an option. That's the thing that's really scary when you did in British government, because that is a sensible option. You are talking a sensible, logical idea. If we had the yard space to do that, we don't. So if you want to, uh, in the nicest way, the same yard which builds the Type 26s will be building the Type 83s. So that's going to be that yard. So if that yard is building the Type 47s, then we've lost that yard to build the Type 83s. That's the reality. That's the problem.
I hope that helped. Black Maximus, if Japan had built four Ryujo-class car carriers like they had been building crews at that rate, would it be more likely to lead to light carriers being allowed on 10,000 tons? Um, it could have caused issues. Because they could have said, look, you know, in nicest way, we, we, we've got these carriers. I think you're more likely to see someone of them have to concede on the idea of maybe a cruiser carrier. With up to 10,000 ton limit for a cruiser carrier and everyone having a, uh, being allowed a certain percentage of cruiser carriers. Or them trying to do what they did, which was force them to all be the same numbers. Um, they will be included in the carrier numbers. Uh, it, it could go either way. Honestly, I would hope... If they saw it was a really red line for the Japanese and the Japanese threatened to leave over it, they'd probably go with cruiser carriers, and then you'd have cruiser carriers and uh, fleet carriers as categories. And the cruiser carriers would be any aircraft carrier below 10,000 tons. And you'd probably have a limitation on that as well. So then you'd, what you'd have would uh, in effect would happen would probably be the British and the Americans would end up building some. Don't you remember me? With the theoretical World War II helicopters, could they carry heavy rockets, bombs, with like Tiny Tim and all that? Potentially. It would take some work and take some designing, but potentially I can't see why you couldn't design them. Now, the thing is, no. so, nice turn. The question is related to the first volume of Wales, How to Wings. Okay, book series. Where a 13,000 ton colossal CVL with river plate iron ships as our escorts sink the grass bay. Well,. You have to remember the Colossus class is a design ba it's 9042 design is based off a shrunk down unicorn design, which is why it droops for three thousand tons, and it's a war emergency build. So you wouldn't have that available when the graph space is sunk. In the nicest way, that isn't what the Royal Navy would have built. That's someone taking a ship of history, and I do realise the Colossus class when they're built. But it's taking, someone taking history and transposing back the scenarios which cause it to be built back a lot earlier. There is a reason why the, uh, the Colossus class is a 1942 design. It's listed as the 1942 design. Not the 1938 design. The 1938 design des uh, options were probably about about the same as Unicorn, honestly, if I remember, if I remember correctly from the papers. They're about sixteen thousand tons, and if they've been gone when if they've been built, they would have been available. But again, it's how many do you have? Where are they going to be put? Will there be one down in the South America division? Why do you have a carrier down in the South America division? Do you expect you're going to face carriers? Um, a strong naval aviation. Okay. Uh, the carriers which were available in around that period were Hermes. Uh, Hermes was a down, was down there. She was operating with the French. So Hermes could have been available. Ark Royal comes steaming down renown. Um, but again, it, it, where are these ships coming from? Is the question. It's in a nice way. You are asking me a question based on a world which I am not intimately familiar with on, in a fictional world, in a history, and I don't know why they brought it along. I would need to know the, the if it's a thirteen thousand ton colossus. Yes, it can do quite a lot of damage very quickly, because let's be honest. Uh, Colossus class carriers, well, they get away with having no four and a half inch guns. They're pretty much um, the majestics are pretty much better because they mainly drop up to fifteen thousand tons, far closer to the Colossus class, uh, to the uh, to the uh, it's a unicorn design, and their capabilities are fairly decent. Um, Colossus herself, let's see, she usually carried roughly 48 aircraft, so yeah. She could do pretty darn well with that. She could do multiple strikes. 
They then attack the Germans in port with night time, a multi-carrier raid, destroying turpits. Well, if you're taking in multiple carriers and you're attacking it, then wonderful, that's the book. Could they do that? Yes. If you've got multiple carriers and you go and launch the strikes and you hit the target, yes, you can do that. It's, But it's that's a fictional book. And it's moved a lot of history around to make that fit. For starters, again, the British would not have built that carrier at that time if they'd had the choice. If they'd been building... The carriers they're building at the time are all full fleet carriers. They're not building light fleet carriers. Light fleet carriers are war emergency design based on the unicorn shrunk down for war emergency construction. So it's taking off a lot of the workshops and a lot of the supply stuff and lots of the extra things fitted into the uh, fitted into unicorn. Um, Yeah, they are disposable warships. They are not going to be built before wartime, uh, war begins, because the British don't build disposable warships in peacetime. They're good ships. And a breath up. The new DDX is how the video seems to focus on utility and seems very unstealthy compared to Zomers. While new planes and even ground vehicles are incorporating in it. Uh, I would say the DDX designs... Um, Don't t take everything with a pinch of salt until it's actually built. Okay. Um, they are planned to be built in, I think, in 2032. So that is eight years away and a lot of... That's at least two governments and all sorts of things away. So who knows what's going to happen in that time, Bofa. Uh, um, <laughs> honestly... We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> the world the world can change dramatically between now and 2032. Siglock, you're talking infrastructure. So you're talking how many yards do we realistically need to activate in the current world position? Well, it depends what you want to do. If you want to maintain the current force, you need the two yards you've got and probably a third one to build submarines and a fourth one to build small ships. Which is roughly what we've got going. But if you want to build things bigger than them, and you want to build, keep building those destroyers and uh, those frigates, etc., concurrently, then you're probably going to need a fifth yard doing the construction work. And you've got other yards doing refitting, etc., and supply ships. So once you start looking around the UK, you realise very quickly our yards are kind of full up. They're kind of maxed out. Black Maxwell, what if the Strait of Gibraltar was the same with as that of the Messina Strait? I'm going to look up the exact distance of the Straits of Messina in terms of this width. Um, its narrowest is 3.1 kilometers or 1.9 miles. Strait of Gibraltar is roughly 8 miles or 7 nautical miles. Um... Well, you know that the uh, various navies got in and out of the Mediterranean in World War Two. Uh, World War Two, various ships got in and out without be uh, you know, uh, without having to exchange fire with the other side of the strait. That would be very unlikely to happen because let's be honest, if you've got a nine point two inch gun, uh, the British put up there that has a range of. Uh, 26,700 meters. <laughs> so, um, 
that pretty much can dominate uh, that can dominate the Straits of Gibraltar quite well. Uh, in terms of the Straits of Messina, if you've got a 9.2 inch gun sitting up there firing across the Straits, that's basically that's point blank shooting range. It's not nice. Uh, were there any plans to build more than one unicorn in the 1930s? Yes, it was basically it was the plan was that you'd build the unicorn and then I think. They're ordering 1939, I think the next one was going to be ordered 1940, next one 1941, and next one 1942 was pretty much the ordering plan. I think they were going for it on the route off. Um, no, sorry, the book says that light carriers were built for trade protection, they are being built because the Royal Navy in the book basically started to rearm much earlier in investing. Uh, well, for starters, they'd have to break out the treaty for that to work, for them to be building those ships, because they're over, they're, they're, they're definitely going to be counted against treaty tonnage. And so you'd be building them instead of other things. And also, that isn't what the Royal Navy would build for treaty uh, for trade protection. And the reason I say that is because the Royal Navy actually has designs for trade protection. And they are all roughly 12,000 tons Hermes types. Or once you start looking at their light, cr light carriers, etc., that they're actually building their 16,000 ton types. Um, and the 13,000 type is a war emergency design. Um, based on the 16,000 ton type, but shrunk down. Although, it's often claimed to have been based on the illustrious class, which is strange, because the profile is completely different once you get to hull structure and subdivision. Back in a second, I've just been told, sent a message that the um, bird table has fallen over, and I've got to go make sure the food's not on the floor. Give me a second. doing this cross-legged? I have no idea, but I am. I am. Because I can. That's why I'm doing it cross-legged. Because I can. I don't know. I've got to spend all time at the gym. I've been getting there slowly. Now I've not been coughing properly for the last 48 hours. I can probably start going tomorrow or Tuesday. Probably Tuesday sensible because the car park is going to be an absolute nut tomorrow. Hello everyone. Right then, sorry. Back. Do you agree modern uh, that uncrewed boats could make modern PT, uh, PT boats or torpedo boats so interesting? Yes, both of they could do. Bill Williams, very windy here in Cornwall. Cool! How you doing, Phil? How's life going? Um, it is windy in the UK tonight, as I said at the beginning. Do hope the birds remain in the, ca in the cage. There's no birds in the cage, it's just the bird, uh, the bird table. Um, da -da 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 -da. <clears throat> right then. So, as I seem to have caught up enough to be able to do another book, I'm going to catch up and do another book. So, we are at 0250, by my count. Uh, maritime operations. In the Russo Japanese War, C. 
So, Julian Corbett. Because from the previous few, you think, you know, they only start writing these things up in World War II. No, the British are always getting people to write up battle studies. Where do you think he gets his information from for this battle study? He gets it from the British assessments, which come through uh, prior to, um, yeah, that's gone. Uh, sorry, spotted something which had come flying in with me from the storm, and it wasn't going to get shelter in my books. Um, the British start doing this early on. The British have been doing these sort of assessments, these battle uh, operations assessments for a very long, long time, even before they had a staff which were really doing it properly. So that is a fact of life, and some, one of the most interesting things you can find if you go back through the National Archives and various personal archives where they're stored is these assessments. This is the combined assessment of the Japanese war effort. And it's put together with the help of people like Pacnam, etc., people who were out in Japan with the Japanese fleet or writing their reports home. So whilst it's not a personal first-hand account, it is heavily supported by primary sources. The Japanese had also definitely re-established their settlement at Songshin. 120 miles up the coast, and had 4,000 troops at Kiltisil, uh, Kiltisil, watching the Russians at Kengsheng. Our minister further said that he had been officially informed that it was expected that while the Japanese attention was occupied with the Baltic fleet, the Russians would probably make an effort to recover northeastern Korea. But the Japanese had no intention of again withdrawing from it, and the preparations were intended to meet the anticipated Russian advance. Three days later, the consul reported that on the April the 27th, four Japanese transports had arrived and were landing troops, who were to proceed north towards Vladivostok by land. All arms were represented, and the intention was to bring the total force landed up to 10,000 men. In forwarding this intelligence on May 9th, our minister said, in confirmation of the consul's report, that from the Japanese legislation, he had heard, learned that 15,000 men had been landed, and that the object in view was to forestall a Russian movement across the two men, which was expected to synchronise with the approach of the Baltic fleet. It would look, therefore, as though the Japanese staff were contemplating the possibility of the Russians seizing Gensan by a combined operation of the Baltic fleet and the Yasuri army, either as a temporary base or a harbour of refuge. Seeing that, in addition to this, the success of such a design would have the effect of uh, extending to the sea the Russian army of the Yula Yalao, which formed their left wing and are bringing it into touch with their fleet, a situation of great irritation, to say the least, would be set up. And it is not unreasonable to suppose on the evidence that the Japanese, with their characteristic care in making every foot of ground good, were taking urgent measures to prevent so disturbing an eventuality. As events turned out, the whole of these hurried preparations proved to be premature. But it so happened that, although there is nothing to show the Russians had any designs on Gensan, the Japanese appreciation of the other possibilities of the situation were at the time by no means unjustifi unjustified. Admiral, Zos Admiral Rosovensky, so far as our information goes, was within an ace of coming on as they expected, and his reason for wishing to do so was closely connected with the intention intended confusing effect of Admiral Dewar's reconnaissance. As the battle fleet was passing Singapore, the Russian consul came out with such intelligence as he had been able to gather. From newspapers which he brought, uh, uh, brought, bought, brought off, they learnt that the Manchuri army sorry, had been decisively defeated at Moncton, a fact which had hitherto hither, hither, hither been concealed from the fleet. And that General Levich, who had su uh, superseded General K uh, Koropatin, was in full retreat on Tinglong. The chief naval item was it that about three weeks previously, the Japanese fleet had steamed towards Singapore and had then proceeded to Borneo, where they formed a temporary base connected to it by cable with Singapore. The other important item was that on April 7th, Admiral Negmagasov had left Djibouti. The general effect on the news in the fleet was not bad. Their final achievement of bringing so large a force across the Indian Ocean intact, culminating as it did in their defiant passage of the Straits of Malacca, had raised the spirit of elation that even the army's misfortunes could not damp. But with the Admiral and his staff, it was different. The last piece of information that Admiral Nogotov was still coming on and had already passed out of the Red Sea produced a feeling of something like exasperation in their minds. 
They had contemplated with some confidence that their sudden stealing across away from Nozir Bay without giving a rendezvous would lead to the recall of the obsolete squadron. But it was clear that the scheme had failed and that the government had ordered Admiral Nogodov to carry on. What had actually happened was this. Admiral Nogodov had reached Djibouti on the April 3rd. And that is more than a fortnight after the main squadron was clear of Madagascar. There he had telegraphed home for its position. And the reply was that nothing was known to the staff of its whereabouts, but that he was to hurry up to the Sunda Strait, where accurate intelligence might be obtained from the Russian intelligence agents. After calling, he proceeded accordingly on the 7th in the entire ignorance of his chief's intended movements. He had still have a chance of getting the information he required, for it seems that arrangements had been made for getting in touch with him from Colombo. Accordingly, after passing Cape Gurudafiri, he sent away to transport Coronia to that port, and to give her time to fulfil her mission, he took the squadron into Mirbat on the Arabian coast, about 500 miles east of Aden, on the 12th. Then he waited two days, and then sailed again, setting his course for the Sundar Strait. By this time, Adorozhensky, such at least was the impression of his staff, had formed a remarkable resolution in a last effort to throw off the unwelcomed reinforcement. It was founded on the prevailing false appreciation of the probable strategy of the Japanese, which Admiral Dewa's crews had been intended to emphasise. His confusing movement did indeed give so much colour to the categorical information of the Russian consul as to the supposed forward movement of the Japanese fleet that it could admit of only one interpretation. Admiral Togo had made an attempt to seek them out in the neighbourhood of Singapore and having missed them there, had gone off to Borneo in order to inter intercept them in their passage northward from Sunda Strait, and Rosensky could therefore believe that by his sudden and secret move he had eluded his adversary. By carrying on at once he might possibly pass Formosa ahead of him, and this idea took form, uh, form of a shape as, in readiness for meeting the enemy at any moment, he proceeded onward through the China Sea without finding any trace of them. As we all know, Admiral Turgo was not so stupid. And Motogo was lying in wait for him, for his enemy to come to him. Because, frankly, why, when your enemy is making the, uh, the mistake of coming to the very tippy-toppy end of his string, so far on his logistic string that he is going to cause it to snap, do you then assist him by going to him? You don't. You let him come to you, let him make the mistake, and then you deal with him. Never interfere with your enemy when they're making a mistake. It's far more fun to let them make it. Oh. I think electric, electronic warfare is very complicated for ships and that you can probably add a lightweight shell or stealth st of stealth stuff on your hull and it's super as a late addition. That's only right. How improvements in radar made self technology much less important to ships and planes? No. It's still there. Cold Surrounds. I like how Corbett's works are available online for free. It does make life easy, but I would say I like having the physical copies. So, I like this one. It's not too expensive as well. Um, take care, Tanif. Mega Scrow. Hardy Breeze over here. Lucky you. Down trim. I think electronic warfare is complicated. Answer that one. Um... I now, Dan Freeman, I now have visions of a couple of Celts watching the Battle of Actium to write up a report, except the druids say no writing, so it has to be oral history. Potentially. Dan Maximus, would you rather be visiting Australia in the middle of the summer or Canada in the middle of the winter? I do better in cold than heat, so I'm going to go Canada. Ames Morrison, were there ever plans to build more than one unicorn? And if so, why are they abandoned? I just said there were plans to build more than one. And they weren't really abandoned. It was just there's Churchill's decision, then there's the onset of war construction, and then eventually uh, there's the 1942 light fleet carrier. So basically that's how it goes. Steve Clark, if Germany had flooded the Denmark Straits with U-boats to support Denmark Strait pri uh, prior to the Operation Rundberg, attempt to clear any warships, would this have made a difference? It could have been very interesting, but also the fact... It's going to sound strange. That sort of action cannot be done without a lot of signals. And people often think, and I, I know I discussed this on this channel a bit, but I'm going to keep discussing it until people realise it. 
the big thing in enemy information you gather from watching their signals isn't necessarily decoding the signals, it's traffic analysis. So you get a lot of traffic going on with submarines, and they are all, all the things are starting to head in the direction of Denmark Strait. What do you do? You tell the Royal Navy exactly where they're going to be. They tell them they're heading towards Denmark Strait. So what does the Royal Navy do? Well, probably HMS Victorious gets spun up, and, Queen, and King George V gets spun up, and you get, instead of renown, uh, instead of um, Hood and Prince of Wales waiting for Prince, uh, Prince um, Jürgen and Bismarck, you get Victorious launching strikes of them from outside of range of those submarines in that area. And you get the reality that there are three capital ships waiting for them if they try and push forward. Because the thing is, whilst in the, dem in the straits, the submarines could protect them and could perhaps clear the area, they, can only, they can't move that fast unless they surface. And if they surface, they can be picked off. So they're going to be under the surface. So that means that once the, the battleships, the France Prince Bismarck and Prince Jürgen are going to through there, the British know exactly where they're coming from and they're waiting for them. So, yeah, flooding it would, would certainly get them through the Straits of um, Denmark. It wouldn't get them much further. It would actually reveal their position. So it's not a good idea overall. Pardon me. Um, nice room. Would a 9.2 inch gun, 15 to 15 half to 18 thousand ton county style cruiser have fared better or worse in the Pacific War? Probably better. Probably. But there again, it's going to be against other 9.2 inch, 18 inch thousand ton. You know, th that's the thing. It, it's going to change the war. The moment you have that bigger change, you're basically talking about cruisers being 50% to 80% larger and having much more bigger, much more powerful guns. That's going to change history. It just is. An 18,000 ton ship can probably carry 12 in four triple turrets of, of 9.2 inch guns. That's going to be a different vessel than a... That's going to be a completely different operational statistics than something which is that. Although, think about a 9.2 inch gun being angled up to 70 degrees. That just... Oh, good lord. That has an effect on you, but I'm not sure what it is. Mm. So, ooh, have I caught up the questions again? Should I do? A, should I drag, grab a fourth book? Because I think I've done three. I'm sure, I had plans for a fourth as an option. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not that one. I've done that one quite recently. Yeah, da da dee. I think that one. Yeah, we'll do that one. <laughs> and I want it. Japanese, the rise and fall of the Japanese naval. So, 
Principal Japanese Na Imperial Japanese Imperial Naval Air Service. And well, this is a good book. This is a fun book. But let's go to this chapter to eight, Welding of the Weapons. I'll give you an example of it. During the course of 1935, three attempted assassinations took place on the lives of the Finance Minister, the Lord Keeper of the Privy Seal, Admiral Seto, and General Wanatame, Wana the Inspector General. Also, a further naval conference took place, convened late in the year, at which the Japanese once again demanded ship parity with the USA and Britain. Parity was not agreed, and the Japanese delegation left the conference in disgust. The interesting thing is, the Japanese couldn't have built up to parity, even if they got it. Basically, it would have bankrupted them. Their infrastructure, they'd have, they'd have finished building up to parity with the UK and USA about 1960. In Japan, a naval aviation design competition was initiated for a new low-wing monoplane torpedo bomber. Mitsubishi produced the B-5M, powered by a 1,000 horsepower Kinsei engine designed by Natsujiji Nakamura. This plane was characterized by fixed landing gear and folding wing. The Nakajima Company entered entry was the B-5N, with a retractable on the carriage and folding wings, and powered by the 840 uh, HP Hikari engine, 840 horsepower Hikari engine, being the product of the designer Yoji Hattori. After preliminary tests, the Navy liked both machines and decided to place orders accordingly. Eventually, 1,250 Mitsubishi B-5M and Type 97I carrier-based attackers and 150 Nakajima B-5N Type 97-2 carrier attack bombers were manufactured. Both aircraft were used for the Sino-Japanese War until the end of the Pacific War. Meanwhile, the all-important works of the Mitsubishi A-5M carrier fighter continued, uh, so much so that the, by January 1935, some 10 months after the inception of the project and the design work was completed. The appointment of Lieutenant Commander Koyabayashi H.I. Himjim? H.I.J.M.M. was confirmed as Chief Test Pilot on the Nanayin Shi program in charge of fighter pilots. The new commanding officer congratulated the design team by presenting a haiku, a 17-syllable verse expressing praise on a suitable illustrated manuscript. The flight tests commenced on the 4th of February at Kagamashara, no, uh, Kagami, Kagamagara, oh, my Japanese pronunciation is getting worse, Airbase. The more I study Japanese, the more it's getting worse. I have to say, I, I do agree with Gareth. It is a confusing subject, uh, uh, language to try and pick up. Um, it's a lovely language. It's very poetic and very pretty, but it's confusing. Mitsubishi's pilot, Kajima, commenced the test flying, in which the new plane exceeded all expectations. The maximum speed being 276 miles per hour, the Nakajima entry only achieved 247 miles per hour, well below that of the A5M. Unfortunately, the landing run of the Mitsubishi machine proved too long for use on aircraft carriers. Meanwhile, the lieutenant commander completed the flight test program at Kam Kagamagara Air Base while he resided at the Nagawara Hotel in Gyuho City. Speed calibration tests on the A5M proved a maximum speed of 279 miles per hour at 10,500 feet, and a rate of climb to 16,400 feet in 5 minutes 54 seconds. This compared with the British Gloucester Gladiator, which had a maximum speed of 253 miles per hour at 14,500 feet, and a rate of climb of to 15,000 feet of, of in 4.8 minutes. At a time, the two major difficulties had arisen. The experiencing of pitching oscillations and ballooning upon landing associated with the use of split landing flaps as was used on the imported American Northrop machines. The US aircraft was a two-seater of very recent importation, part of the policy of importing highly successful aircraft to reveal their secrets, which would be incorporated into the next generation of Nippanese carrier attack bombers. The next series of tests were the flight evaluation of dog la of dogfighting, uh, tests in which the squadron was under the command of Lieutenant Ryosuke Nomura, and included Chief Warrant Officer Masse and the First Flight Petty Officer Motruzukiwagi. Mochukazuki. After each mock combat, aeronautical engineers to brief the test pilots to ascertain stress and performance details were a view to increasing the aircraft's capability. At the time, Japanese pilots required the lightest aircraft and the most maneuverable, maneuverable seeking to master every known maneuver of the fighting pilot repertoire. A total of 15 engine variations were tried on the A5M series fighters. As previously mentioned, the A5M1 flew on 4 February 1945, powered by the 550 horsepower Nakajima Kotobori 5 radial engine and having a gull shaped wings. 
Next variant, the A5M2, was engined with a 560 horsepower, Cotterbury 3, and this model was followed in 1957 by the A5M2A and the A5M2B. The A5M3 was to have the 690 horsepower Hispano Sousa inline engine, with the A5M4 was following by the K version, being a special training variant. In all, some 1,000 machines of this type were eventually to be manufactured. 800 by Mitsubishi and 200 jointly by Sesbo and Naval Air Depot and the Kyushu Aircraft Company. It's a good and interesting book. Okay. By Maximus, how large would a tribal class destroyer have to be to have the same number of guns turrets but have two quadruple 24.5 inch torpedo launchers? Ability wise, you're probably talking about an extra 200 tons. I'm guessing about 2,000 tons, probably. Once you're including all the ship structure and everything else. I know some people can say it will come and go, go, oh, you could do it less, but no, once you are keeping the guns in their positions and you're designing the stability of the ship and you're building in, you've got to have twin launchers center. You're probably going to end up with it being about 200 tons more once they add in everything else, including crew and facilities, etc. for them. And especially as it's 24 and a half inch torpedoes rather than the 21 inch they historically used, I don't Yeah, they used 21 inch. Let's check. My brain just went dead. It was going 21 inch, then I went, oh, is it 21 inch? Is it? Is it? I was right, 21 inch, yeah. So if you're going, if you're jumping up from 21 inch by three and a half inch to, the quad, to from one quadruple 21 inch to two quadruple 24 uh, four and a half inch ones, i.e. nail rod style torpedoes, then yes, you've got to you've got to chunk up in weight. Henry Bofa, how does Britain react in 90s if Germany stops building battleships and only builds battlecruisers? Probably laughs to an extent, because Germany can't get... Uh, there's a, you have the battlecruisers, but you can't get them anywhere. They've got to fight the British to get past. Especially as German battlecruisers are quite slow. But to an extent, the British probably end up building battlecruisers themselves and build more battlecruisers themselves. And so they would focus more on the battlecruiser construction. As well, but the British would still keep building battleships because you have to remember the British are matching the ja uh, the uh, the the German uh, the Americans and the Japanese and the Italians. So the British probably build more battle cruisers, yes, but they would still keep building battleships, and the British could afford to do that. You probably get scenarios of like four four being ordered every year with four battle cruisers being ordered four battleships, and that probably be how the British would uh, would push on. So they can match against the Jap uh, match against the Germans, but also be able to have the force to fight the Americans and Japanese on paper if they needed to. Um, the Racken Red. If Britain had nine cruisers, uh, had the nine cruisers, we would have had more Alaska type. Uh, had had a nine. If Britain had had the nine cruisers, do you mean nine point two inch cruisers or nine cruisers? We would have had more Alaska type ships because we had been building them in response to everyone else's twelve inch. Um, potentially. Nice to go, everyone. If the British Empire paid back its war debt more slowly to fund reorganize the Royal Navy, wouldn't the British shipbuilding industry build merchant hulls for its own and others um, to bring money in that allow the British to pay their debt down quicker? They would still keep building it. British, uh, the British maritime industry kept building them anyway, so a nice way that's just going to be a constant. That, they built that anyway. But again, you're going to have an effect on the wider industry, so you're going to be building, you're going to keep more ships coming through. Siglock, you have said the RM prepared for war in 1941 42. 42 onwards, actually, but yeah, 41 42, I'll accept that. What were their expected ship numbers in that? Because I'm saying, what's the realistic for war to go going into 1947 based on historical laugh length? Um, it would certainly be a far stronger position to start off. 
if you consider they were trying to build up their battle, uh, their capital ship numbers, etc. The British were being very slow. One of the first things you have to you look at when you start to realize is that King George Fifths are coming to service. They're not talking about re retiring any of the arts. The Lions were going to be coming to service. They're not talking about retiring the arts. The, the basically it's the class after the it's towards the end of the Lions that they are going to start re retiring the arts, and mainly that's to help build the vanguards. So the whole idea of the Rs going is going to be to help support the, the next generation of vanguards. And the first generation of vanguard, first vanguard comes in, that doesn't touch an R class, does it, R class. So you'll basically be talking about the next generation, va next vanguard coming in. That might well replace another, uh, replace an R class. But by that point, they're expecting to have five and six. So they're expecting to have roughly eleven modern ships coming into service or very closely into service by the time which they start getting rid of an R class. If you then add in the twenty-three, uh, the sixteen ships they had in, well, let's see, I'm talking about five, five, three, fifteen, fifteen ships they have in service. Uh, the three of uh, the uh, Renown, Repulse, Hood, uh, Nelson, Rodney, five Queen Elizabeths, and five um, R's. The Royal Navy is very much building up towards roughly twenty-four, twenty-five capital ships, and that's really what they're looking for. And they're building up carry numbers as well. The Courageous, Glorious, Furious have not been announced to be getting rid of. It's a case of they're building up their fleet. What they would have had by 1942 in service, that's another three years. So you're going to have some of the some of the Lions in service, you're going to have some of the King George Vs, all the King George Vs in service, and you're going to have Vanguard possibly coming into service as well um, by 1942. You're also going to have the next generation being built. And you're going to have had three more years for modernizations. So Hood will have been modernized, possibly Repulse as well. Or I know Repulse is often talked about as being going to be got rid of, but there's also a, there's also an argument for modernizing her and the British are still considering it. It's one of those things, it's on the papers, it's on the books of maybe we get rid of her, maybe we don't. But see, the British are reacting to the situation. If they see other people building up their capital ship numbers, they're more likely to modernize than replace. So the Queen of Stay are more likely to modernize and then replace, and they're sort of the R's are the ones which are going to go. So they're more likely to modernize everything else. Oh, Hood definitely goes in for modernization, Repulse maybe as well, and definitely the Queen Elizabeth's going for it. So you could end up very quickly with 1941-42, you could end up with the Royal Navy having at least four of the Lions, maybe a Vanguard, and... The, uh, the five King George Vs in service, so you could end up with them having a force of 25 capital ships in service. At which point, you also start to look at it and go, well, how many more will the Italians have in service? Not that, they won't have really changed much. How many more will the Germans have in service? Probably not that much, because the nice way, they don't have the funding to really change that much. The British are going to jump up by far more than those two will, and definitely more than the Japanese will. The Japanese will get Yamato and Mushashi in that time. That's what they got historically in that time. <laughs> I must have, if in the helicopter scenario we talked about uh, this week, if the Japanese have got enough helicopters, have got, have good enough helicopters to help in the answer to the role, would American submarines still be able to be somewhat effective? They'd be facing the same problems as the German submarines, okay? Uh, the U-boats. It's a case of they are still submersible. They are still, in many ways, submersible long-range torpedo boats. And they will have to dive to avoid a, a helicopter orbiting around and patrolling around a convoy. So they'll have to do that, dive and be underwater for that. Which means they get far less ability to catch up. If the helicopters have any can spot them, they can drop depth charges. And if they can, if they're on surface, they could fire rockets at them. If I'm not sure if the Japanese will have dipping sonar, I, I think the dipping sonar, if it does come in in World War Two, it's going to be American British because those are where the experiments are being run. But there again, the Japanese are very canny with some of their electronic equipment. They have, one of the interesting things is when you get into the debate of whether they have radar or not. And as I've discovered on I've discussed on this channel a few times, their entire um, British and American units and joint units, Allied units which are out there tracking and dealing with Japanese radars. That tells you they have radars and they're useful because they're tracking them down and dealing with them. 
So the idea the Japanese didn't have electronics is a difficult one to own. But saying that, dipping sonar is a completely different thing. They might not have got on. But yeah, I, d I do see that causing the Americans trouble. Does it stop the Americans being effective? Probably doesn't stop them necessarily, because that would require the Japanese also implementing having enough vessels to implement a convoy program and actually carrying it out. And that's a di completely different thing. Because there's no that you can have all the equipment, but if you don't do actual or do it, actually do the operational utility of it, then it doesn't matter how much equipment you have, it just ain't gonna work. Hendrik Bofa, if the UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand decide to unite, how much larger would the new navy need to be to, la uh, to be larger or just leave it to the USA? Uh, they wouldn't leave it to the USA. They would. It would need to be slightly larger, but also it would be different. Um, you'd probably be looking at... If you've got a Calvary Canada, Australia, New Zealand, you're probably looking at about four, uh, four or five fleet carriers, four or five LHDs, and all sorts of units below that. But it's going to be decided by what they can and what they want. Especially once you start to combine the funding. And it's going to be a case of where is the training going to be? Where is uh, where is the strategic headquarters going to be? How are they going to treat it? Who's going to be in what positions? It it's, uh, becomes how do they unite? All these things become an interesting discussion point. Uh... I will do some. I will do some more, but I, I'm not going on too late because it is raining and pouring, and the dogs are apparently upset. I've just had a message of dogs are cry uh, dogs are inside, not liking the wind. I do love that. I get the pictures sent through to me on WhatsApp of dogs not enjoying the storm, and worrying about Papa outside. Two o'clock. Hi. Yeah, for thought. For a long time, any future war in space is not going to be fought by U.S. Air Force pilots, by U.S. and submarines, because it's combat similar to other subs, not aircraft. Any comments? It is closer. It, let's put it this way. When you're talking about operations within the Earth orbital sphere, the orbital of Earth, within the orbital sphere, so when you're within uh, the atmosphere, uh, even the upper atmosphere, and when you're within the orbital sort of area, you're talking about space fighter work. The moment you're talking about space combat, i.e. interplanetary or anything like that, you are talking about probably something closer to submarines. Because, let's be honest, you are sealed up in a, in a, in a hull, and you can't go anywhere. You can't get off, you can't get out, you have to keep going, you have to cover all your food, everything with you, everything you have to take with you, and it's going to be a long-term flight. It's not going to be quick, it's going to be months. If the US built to the limits of the Washington Naval Treaty, I suspect Japan would be bankrupt by the time of the London Treaty. The Japanese did build to the limits of the Washington Naval Treaty. So the Japanese built to the that, that limits they could. And the Washington Naval Treaty, remember, doesn't have limits. It has limits on capital ships and carriers. It has no limits on cruisers and destroyers. So you can build as many of those as you like. So basically, if the Americans and the Brits, Americans had built as many cruisers as they wanted and hadn't restricted their funding so and their destroyer, the British would have responded and the Japanese would have gone bankrupt. But that's because the Washington Naval Treaty doesn't have limits on cruisers and destroyers and submarines. They only have limits on carriers and battleships, and well, capital ships, which are de facto battleships because the only people who have battle cruisers are the British and the uh, Japanese. Nice second. The RM plan works. The British have got the treaty's limit for the carrier's standard at 24,000 tons, and the CVL's uh, displacement between increased to 12,000 tons. There is no CVL. Okay, okay. I'm just going to take it as you you want me to talk about this whole scenario. Okay, let's talk it through. Uh, but then the IJN quits the treaty, allowing the RM to go on a carrier building spree and invest heavily into naval aviation. It was 25,000 tons, not 24,000 tons. Um, okay. I think the British were trying for 22,000 tons. And I seem to remember that was an attempt to, because they wanted to get six, they want to get six carriers under 135,000 tons. Leaving that to one side, 
and leaving that all to one side. Um, I think 22,500 tons were their aim, really. Because then that does get you six carries under 135,000 tons. If you have this scenario and the RN goes on a building spree because the Japanese have broken it, then they've got a light carrier of 12,000 tons, but then they got the IJN quits the treaty. What does the RN build? Well, the RN probably, does, if he's got a design for 12,000 ton carrier, probably does build it, but it very quite rarely it's going to stay at 12,000 tons. And if they're allowed to build whatever they like, it's not going to stay at 24,000 tons or 22,000 tons. It's got, the British are going to push it up to roughly 26, 27,000 tons. Because 27,000 tons you can build an armoured fleet carrier of the size of Ark Royal. So you can build an air group of roughly 60 to 70 aircraft internal. Um, the hang away the British liked on them with the armoured deck of the illustrious class. So the British probably do that. Uh, with, a light with a light fleet carrier, it's, it's going to be a base of their, their cruiser carrier design, which is for escort, trade, and reconnaissance work. Which they wanted an air group of roughly... F they would hap It would happy with an air group of roughly 36. So, but, you know, they were prepared to accept air groups of 18 to 24, but they'd have liked an air group of 36 for that. So, yeah, you're probably talking that, but they probably go with the 16,000 ton design. The reason they go to 16,000 ton design rather than the 13,000 ton of peacetime design, uh, the wartime, the 13,000 wartime design, but the 16,000 ton peacetime design, is because it allows you far more operational independence. And it allows you to operate on a far more austere basis. So you consider if you're operating a, fl a light fleet carrier, even a light fleet carrier down in the South Atlantic, where are the bases going to support it? Falklands has nothing. Cape Town? But that's the other side of the South Atlantic from uh, from South America. Um, the Caribbean? That's the other end of South America from where you're operating most of the time. So basically you need to be able to operate at long distances in an austere, envi austere support environment. So that's why I think they probably could go a 16,000 ton design. But yeah, if the, the, that's the you are repeating to me a, a, something which a, uh, an author has come up with as their basis and their reasoning for it, and that's fine. I don't agree with that, but that's because that's my area of speciality. I've been studying that area for ages, and I have very firm views. As I said before, when we started this whole year of the aircraft carrier, the thing that's always worried me with doing the year of the aircraft carrier is that I do have very firm views because I have spent my life a lot of my life researching it. So I am very, very firm in those views, which makes me less, in a way, adaptable to some of the views of others when they put them forward. Because I'm sitting there going, and all I can see, and all I can mentally see is the problems with that. Because you're talking about a 13,000, 12,000 ton design, which was, the P which was the wartime emergency build, where everything was stripped down for war emergency. It has no guns. If we consider that, the Colossus class doesn't have four inch guns. Unicorn does. That's a problem. That means it's got no self defense. Uh, you know, it, yes, it has 40 millimeter. Yes, it has 20 millimeter. That's great, but it doesn't have those four inch guns. And all sorts of things like that add up. Henry Briffer, the Deutschland seems to me the way to slowly, to, uh, too slow to execute the running away from larger than its ships. Would a 6-inch with crazy speed to be the better? Yes. Yes. A decent 8-inch cruiser would have done better. Pretty much anything could have done better than Deutschland class in that scenario. They have great long range so they can go and dance around, but the trouble is once they're caught, they can't run away. Right, Masters, do you think we could smelt metal products on the moon if we are processing meteorites as far as space before sending products down to Earth? Potentially. Potentially, you know. Honestly, I can't see anything which couldn't be worked around or rather developed, but that's with my understanding of the science as it is and how we could potentially develop that science. But it's a lot of science and engineering would have to go into making that from a theory to a practical. Right then, let's see, where are we at? I'm going to say at 
36, it's going to be the finale. So it's going to be the last few questions. Because, as said, I'm going to try and get in for the doggies. And it is already 20 to 11. Then, all right, did the Royal Navy consider building a single 5.25 inch gun for the largest throws? Thank goodness they didn't. Honestly, the Royal Navy had enough with a 5 inch gun they were trying to develop, a 4.7 inch gun, a 4.5 inch gun, a 4 inch gun, and a 5.5 inch gun. They had that. They were working out to various points for destroyers and that, that sort of caliber. So, in nicest way, thank the Lord they didn't have a 5.25 inch gun as well. Take care, Ronald. Go in, in. Good luck with the grocery run. Um, anyway, it's true. The Japanese didn't have numbers, but they had scientists engineers as good as any other nations. But the trouble is, there's a problem of numbers, in that you someone can only work on so many projects at the same time. In fact, usually that's one major project at a time. So if I have ten, twenty engineers and so twenty engineers and scientists of that level, and you have five. I can work on 20 projects. You can work on five. To work with. And the important people are usually are the lead engineers, the people who can run the programs. They're the real paucity. And it's the same with America. America can do a lot more because they have a lot more engineers they can call upon. Vamos, with America going back to the moon in 2026. What are your thoughts about it? Mm. It could be interesting. We'll see what happens. I said, everyone, you missed this question 12. Mm, yeah. Uh, what what arguments could the director and area for construction? And I said, yeah, I did miss it, but the thing is, I'm distracted by you keep talking about this wings or whatever. In trying to figure out where their world has gone from, where they've drawn it from, because there must be something they've drawn it from. They won't have drawn it from thin air, although they could have drawn it from thin air. But it just would seem illogical to me to draw it from thin air when there's so many designs. But they could have just read back and gone, "Well, they came up with this design, so they must have been going to come up with this design." But that doesn't fit with history. That's a war emergency design based on this other design, and the fact that they keep putting on this just goes. Leaving that to one side. Um, question twelve. Uh, what argument could the director of construction have used to get the British large cruiser project going, given the treasury arguments of already having ships to do the job? Well, they couldn't get it going while the treaties were in. While the treaties were in, they couldn't get it going. That's that's just it. The treaties, there's just the tr the large cruiser project doesn't go with the treaties. It depends also when you're asking. If you're asking for a 9.2 inch gun cruiser in 1917, they could have got that one through without any trouble. If you're talking about 1930s, the treaties won't allow it. If you're talking wartime, then they are actually working on it. But the trouble is, they're also, there's all, all sorts of demands for those same yards. The Colossus class, the Majestic class, and all the other light carriers, etc. All those things are using the same yards which you produce large cruisers in. So that's just not happening. So the problem isn't so much the, tre the, the treasury as the treaty for a large period. And then the realities of war in that you have only a finite amount of infrastructure you can use and you have to decide what's more important. Is it the large cruiser or building a light carrier? And it's usually the light, light carrier at that time. And question 11. What would the British do to create nine 12-inch armed large cruisers? Modify an existing design like you said. They don't design one based on... Why would they do it in the first place? That answers your question. Okay, why are they building a 12-inch armored cruiser? Because the British never look at that. It's never really on their format. Because for them, the 12-inch gun is not really a suitable gun for cruiser work. Okay, if everyone else has them and if that had been the treaty limit, they'd have built them. But then you'd have to ask, what are they building it for? Are they building it for a general or purpose cruiser? In which case, it's going to be based something like the county class. Are they building it for a 
combat cruiser? Is it going to be something which they're going to base it on the Nelrod class, on the Nelrods or the F3s? Is it going to be about battle, about fighting fights? In which case it's going to be built for its armour, its survivability, its speed, etc. Those things, it's going to be an F3 design. Are they building it for commerce protection? In which case they might go with an in a completely different shaping. It, it's what are they building it for? Why are they building it? That's going to decide how they're building it. The thing is, it's a cruiser, not a battle cruiser. And yes, the fact it's being armed with 12 inch guns is probably going to annoy them because they prefer 9.2 inch guns or 6 inch guns. Honestly, I'd have two sort of two preferences for cruiser armaments. But if it's going to have to have 12 inch guns because everyone else has 12 inch guns, then you're going to have to ask them what do they want that cruiser for, and that's going to affect their designing of it. Andrew Buffett, would you consider World War II diesel electric surface radar a good idea since you could mount the engine in a line and since and does not need direct line to the screws? How fast could it mean? Well, I was falsely prepared to make the effort into it. That's really the limitation. A diesel electric screws a uh, surface radar is fairly it could be a fairly interesting idea. You could build it in a nicest way. There are lots of electric dr uh, elect uh, electric powered ships. And there are various advantages to design, so you could make it faster, and the Germans certainly were working on various options. Um, the question is, what are you prepared to do, how much money are you prepared to spend, and what are you prepared to add into it? That's your real question. Right then, uh, last questions. Would the, uh, question 10. Would the Germans have banned the 5.9-inch gun and 105-inch AA guns had they got the 5-inch 45 SKC-41 dual purpose gun. I have no idea on that one. I really don't. I've looked into it and it would seem sensible to do so, but there again, so much of what the German Navy does does not seem sensible to me. So I have no idea on that one. It could have gone either way. It depends on a lot of factions and a lot of debates. Right then. I'm going to close the Q&A in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Thank you. Uh, what if the UK today had citizen a Swiss level rail network? I'd be very, very happy because it would make my life a lot easier in travelling around the country. In that I could work and sleep while travelling. <laughs> instead of usually driving. <laughs> the trains do work, but mainly it's the cost of them that's annoying. It's so much more expensive than actually just driving up there. It really is. Especially when I'm going to the various archives around the country. Oh, well, that's helpful. The uh, system had all my... I was thinking South American country. Oh, they, if it was a South American country, they could build something decent. Right. And the Q&A. Make that into live chat. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for watching. Thank you very much for chatting away. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, thank you, Ins Morrison, Steve Clark, Duke of Etchingham. Thank you, Danny Wright. Thank you, Dragon Red. Thank you, Melanie6040. Um, thank you, George Newman. Thank you, Peter Dawson. Thank you, Dave Harrison. Thank you, Knights of Country One. Thank you, Albazaski. Thank you, Dan Freeman. Thank you, Melanie6040, Phil Williams, Leslie Mitchell, Tanif Velika. Thank you, Mega Scrow. Thank you, Calvin Gasberg. Thank you, Steve Clark. Thank you, Don Giovanni, Albazaski. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Cosa Drazinus. Thank you, Richards, for being here. Captain C4. Thank you. Runon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone who's been here and chatting away. Ah, oh, nice, 6041. You've snuck in a last question. Let's see. If the USN's assessment of Hawkins are as able to wipe out every cruiser in the US fleet as an exaggeration, then how much of a threat to US was the Hawkins class? They were certainly capable of wiping out quite a lot of the US fleet in one on one battles. In terms of group actions, that could have been an interesting one. But the US Navy's cruiser force had been severely neglected. So it's not so much a paucity of the capability of the Hawkins class, but a capability, a reflection on the capability of the US Navy's cruisers. The US Navy had not invested heavily in cruisers. They not have a lot of cruiser construction. In fact, if you consider them, they're kind of like the Germans in that they've been getting funding for capital ships, they've been getting funding for destroyers, they haven't had funding for cruisers. And that's the problem for them. The Germans, again, if we, when, if you refer to last year's Jutland, Fleets of Jutland video, the German Navy is in very much an imbalanced force in World War II, in World War One. 
because to in order to build enough try and compete with the British on capital ships, they've neglected cruisers, they've neglected their large torpedo uh, large destroyers, they've neglected all sorts of things to focus in on the constructing the battle the dreadnoughts. And that means they have a paucity in those forces. Which leaves them horrendously imbalanced, which is one of the reasons why Jutland is always going to be an issue for them to fight. The fact they do as well as they do is entirely down to the quality of their leadership and entirely down to Admiral Beatty. If it had been left down to Jalico, then it could have been very different. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. Hope you enjoyed. Uh, thank you, Paul Amos. Thank you, everyone, for the support, for the membership, uh, the memberships to su uh, from Jack Ray, the super chats from people. Thank you, everyone. It's been really, really helpful, and this channel would not exist without your support. So again, to make YouTube happy, I'm going to finish on as I started with this earlier. If you like the video, please like it, because that really helps with the sharing. If you um, want to share the video, that's always wonderful on social media. It's always appreciated. Again, the buttons are down there. If you'd like to see more videos, please do subscribe. Brew Ships is every Sunday, and there are there's another live on a Thursday, and they usually record videos on various days throughout the week, including, as of tomorrow, there will be another of the UAD series videos, which are basically what I do Sunday morning. Twitch streams are repeated on a Monday. But it's a few weeks later they come out on the Monday on YouTube. And if you want to support the channel more, if you want to have a say as what questions we have in the lives, well then there's Patreon where the, the vote takes place. And if you want to support the channel in terms of member having membership, well you can do. And that's when you get the snazzy emojis which are sometimes used by the various people down below in the chat. Uh, the emojis I will point to are these wonderful things. Which includes Beef Wellington, Catalina, Eskimo with her, no, uh, with her bow missing, uh, various things from the channel, history, and of course, the fluffy research assistants. It's always a lot of fun, and thank you Stafford again, and thank you everyone else for your support. Take care everyone, thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed, it's been a pleasure as always, I know I've been a bit tired towards the end, but it's been a pleasure as always, thank you very much, take care, and have a nice evening, and hope to see you again on Thursday. Toodles! Ba da da dum bum 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 battle dum Yada dum Thank you everyone Nightbot the why are you already deleting Ah, <laughs> oh, let it through. Can I let it through? No, you won't let me through.